गुड मॉर्निंग पटनायक सर क्या हुआ क्या हुआ गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग दिस इज मधु फ्रॉम आईटी सर अभी टाइम है एक बार शेयर कर सकते हैं हाँ कितने दिन कितने दिन मैंने हार्ड कॉपी ये थोड़ी दिया मैंने अरे लाइव लाइव ना लाइव हो गया क्या नमस्कार वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग डिपेंडिंग ऑन फ्रॉम वेर यू आर वाचिंग दिस एंड जॉइनिंग दिस आई डब्ल्यू एम सेवन वर्सअप so today is the second day and this is also auspicious day for our metrological community today is the world metrological day and it is also very interesting to see that the theme of this world metrological day is early warning and early action so this is a very vital for our monsoon and also all severe weather forecasting and today we will be discussing that part in our uh, we have a panel of uh, speakers invited speakers oral speakers everything is there so may i now invite dr kunio yoine yama for chairing the session and start the proceeding today okay. yeah okay, so, okay. thank you yeah, thank you thank you thank you uh, dr pata naik uh, can you hear me okay uh, good morning and a good afternoon and evening everyone from all over the world so far is a limited number but uh, i think the, uh, uh, the the number of participants will increase I'm Kunio Yoniyama from Jamstack, and I will chair this session as introduced by the Dr. Pa uh, Patanaik. So from now, uh, we will start this session on the topics uh, related to the high impact laser and field experiment, and uh, we will have four invited speakers. And uh, uh, each speaker will have 90 minutes in total, including uh, discussion time. So ideally, uh, please finish your talk uh, with 15 minutes around so that we can have questions at a uh, certain time, okay? Okay, uh, let's move on to the uh, first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Michael Bell from Colorado State University. His talking title is the interaction between tropical cyclone and vertical wind shear. 
Oh, oh. By the way, the local office will share the thread or uh, make a bow? Yeah, it, yeah, it depends. If you uh, want to share, uh, other we will share. At my convenience. How about that? I can try and see, I can see if I can share it. I did upload it, so if it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, yeah, just okay. try for uh, 30 seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, Professor Bear, please, that is yours. Okay. Oh, it says I have to quit and reopen. So why don't we just have you share it? So. Um, yeah, if you could, if you could share it, that would be better. Okay. Okay. We are sharing. Okay, please sir. Yes, you. looks good. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, present here at the IWM7. Uh, I look forward to meeting many of you in person at, uh, at the future conference. Um, so today I'll be talking about interactions between tropical cyclones and vertical wind shear. I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators on this work, uh, Cheon Chelsea Nam, uh, Philip uh, Klosbach, and Jordan Jones, who uh, are in my research group here at Colorado State University. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we've known for many decades that uh, two of the primary conditions for, for tropical cyclone formation are the presence of warm sea surface temperatures and uh, the uh, low, uh, low vertical wind shear. Um, typically, we use the 850 to 200 millibar uh, wind shear vector for that. Um, this plot here shows on the left the percentage of times during the months uh, shown uh, in, in each uh, upper corner of uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, uh, July, August, September, and October, November, December, where the SST uh, is above the critical threshold of 26.5 degrees. So the red areas here are, are areas where tropical cyclone formation is supported by the ocean conditions. And on the right is the where the shear vector is less than 15 meters per second, which uh, was also for, uh, positive for formation. And you can see that during the Northern Hemisphere winter, the shear um, both, in, for example, in the Atlantic, both the uh, SSTs and the shear are not conducive. But as we move into the spring and, of course, the summertime, um, the both conditions are met. Uh, interestingly, of course, uh, that uh, in the Western North Pacific, uh, the SST and shear conditions are met for many portions of the year. So tropical cyclones are are possible year round. Um, and in the Indian Ocean, uh, in particular, you note that even though the uh, sur sea surface temperatures are warm, um, the shear conditions uh, uh, become unfavorable in the in the main part of the summer uh, due to the monsoon, um, and so the the activity tends to be concentrated in the spring and the fall. So um, we've known this for quite some time that uh, that the shear uh, tends to uh, advance and retreat uh, along with the bare clinic zones. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the details that we've learned in in more recent years. Um, next slide, please. So. Um, it's been known for several decades, uh, starting from some pioneering work by Bill Gray, that uh, one of the primary sources of vertical wind shear in the tropics uh, during the summertime is the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So when the El Nino events occur uh, and the convection is shifted uh, farther to the east in the Pacific, um, that tends to enhance the vertical wind shear, enhance outflow and, and vertical wind shear, which suppresses activity in the uh, east in the Atlantic um, and tends to enhance activity in the Pacific. Uh, the reverse is true uh, during La Nina events where uh, the um, conditions are more favorable in the Atlantic and, and less favorable in the Pacific. Um, next slide, please. Um, but more recently, we've started to dig into this and we've known that although uh, El Nino is one of the primary drivers of shear, um, some work uh, by my student Jordan Jones has uh, done an empirical orthogonal function analysis of shear in the tropical North Atlantic and subtropical North Atlantic and found that um, actually only about 36%, so it is the leading mode, is driven by uh, ENSO variations. Um, and the, that's uh, shown in this upper left plot here is the, uh, the, the PCA, principal component analysis of the shear pattern. Um, but the second leading order mode actually is resulting from Rossby wave breaking uh, into the subtropics, so it's extra tropical sources of, of wind shear. Um, the third EOF uh, we found was associated with Walker circulation dynamics and the fourth EOF was actually associated with Sahel rainfall dynamics and monsoon uh, 
the West African monsoon variability. So even though ENSO uh, is still known to be one, the dominant contributor, um, we can't ignore the, in particular, the contributions from uh, the extratropical sources of raised Rossby wave breaking. Um, next slide, please. Um, some other recent work by uh, Professor Zuo Wang, who's uh, one of the co-chairs of this conference, has shown that in fact, uh, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, uh, that uh, the tropical upper tropospheric troughs and Rossby wave breaking actually can correlate even higher than uh, the El Nino and um, other uh, indices uh, with regards to tropical cyclone formation, uh, hurricane activity, and uh, ACE, or accumulated cyclone energy. And here, these are composites based on a TUT index that was developed for this study, which came out in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in 2020. Um, and uh, you can see that the shear uh, in panels B and E for the Atlantic and the Pacific um, are, are areas uh, that are also associated with uh, drier, or lower column water vapor and higher incidences of Rossby wave breaking, which are uh, detrimental to uh, tropical cyclone formation. Um, next slide, please. Um, but since we've now identified this additional source of uh, shear, we can use it as a source of predictability. And, and this is in, uh, from a paper that is just published actually within the past week, uh, by, uh, led by Jordan Jones, um, where we incorporated a predictor uh, the uh, zonal wind at 200 millibars in, in the Atlantic um, basin uh, to predict, uh, to better predict seasonal hurricane activity. So you can see here the black line is the observed accumulated cyclone energy. Um, the blue line is our original scheme uh, from 2019. The red line is the revised scheme. You can see that it does better. Um, it looks like some of my graphics are gone there in the B and C, but um, you can see the uh, mean absolute error and the R squared values um, are uh, the mean absolute error is decreased in the revised scheme and the R squared values have increased. So we're able to get some better skill by incorporating predictors associated with Rossby wave breaking. Next slide, please. So if we go down now, as we think about uh, going from the seasonal time scales down to the mesoscale, um, we can ask, you know, what, what exactly does shear do to a tropical cyclone? And we've known for some time that shear induces asymmetries, um, but one of the new advances that's come in recent years is the uh, advent of polar metric radar uh, observations. And I'm showing here from a study uh, led by my former postdoc, Yachin Fang, uh, the microphysical characteristics of Hurricane Harvey as it made landfall uh, in the coastal Texas area. And uh, the, the three plots here are the uh, radar reflectivity, differential reflectivity, and uh, diff uh, specific differential phase. And you can see the vertical wind shear vector here is from the southwest. And that leads to the characteristic left of shear uh, precipitation maximum. And you can see that as the, this uh, bottom part here is the is time uh, going down, you can see that as the shear vector rotates, the uh, precipitation maximum stays in that left of shear quadrant. Um, but what polar metric information is able to tell us is that in fact, that precipitation maximum is composed of two distinct parts. In the uh, down shear left quadrant, we see high ZDR associated with larger raindrops. And in the upshear left quadrant, we see high KDP associated with higher uh, number concentration. So what we think is happening here is that uh, these uh, pre the precipitation is being formed uh, down shear uh, where the large drops are falling out and the smaller drops are being swept around in a size sorting mechanism along with a convective to stratiform transition. So um, we're able to get some new insights in the microphysics of how shear interacts with tropical cyclones. Next slide, please. Um, and then a paper that came out last year, we were able to do a thermodynamic retrieval using uh, airborne radar data and uh, develop this schematic to show how shear impacted uh, Hurricane Rita. Um, and essentially what's happened, what I'm showing here is that the vertical wind shear is tilting the vorticity tower indicated in uh, the gray shading um, down shear. Um, and that induces a, a positive vorticity anomaly aloft and a negative vorticity anomaly at low levels. Those balanced anomalies produce low and high pressure uh, uh, anomalies and uh, upward driven pressure gradient in the down shear quadrant. Um, that lifting also promotes a cool anomaly in the potential temperature field. The reverse is true in the up shear direction. So we see downward motion here. Um, that distortion in the isentropes um, leads to essentially this sort of racetrack pattern here where air that's coming around uh, cyclonically around the, uh, around the storm um, is, is being lifted uh, adiabatically and isentropically 
uh, as it goes into the down shear direction, that releases the conditional instability shown by the cloud and the warm anomaly here um, that that uh, leads to some strong deep convection. And then similarly on the on the uh, on the upshear side, we see the descent. So um, so these new observations are able to help us understand the mechanisms that uh, produce the precipitation patterns we've seen for many years. Next slide, please. Um, but it, it's actually even more complicated than that. And in, in fact, the shear uh, interactions are very multi-scale. And this is from a paper published last year, uh, led by my former PhD student, now a postdoctoral uh, researcher, Chelsea Nam, um, where we looked at the impacts on a genesis of Typhoon Hagapit from the Tea Park uh, field campaign in 2008. And we found that the uh, overall result of the shear in this case was uh, detrimental, especially on the synoptic scale, uh, due to a, a large upper level trough that interacted with the pre-depression disturbance. But there was actually favorable conditions uh, at the smaller scales and the shear on the meso beta and meso gamma scales actually helped to organize the convection into coherent squall lines and also to produce horizontal vorticity that could be tilted into the vertical uh, for subsequent stretching and amplification. And so those large scale influences in a vortex merger process um, meet at the meso alpha scale to form the, the tropical cyclone vortex. Um, and, and those uh, processes are detailed in this uh, uh, study. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but one of the challenges is that uh, these shear impacts are highly variable. They're, they're stochastic in many ways uh, due to the interactions between that shear and the convection. And in recent work uh, by uh, Chelsea Nam, um, we've run a series of ensembles uh, using an idealized wharf framework where we vary the shear and the, re and the environmental relative humidity around uh, incipient disturbances. And so the nine panels here are showing the central pressure of simulated storms um, uh, with uh, low uh, vertical wind shear on the top row, moderate vertical wind shear on the middle row, and, and large vertical wind shear on the bottom row. And uh, the left side is dry conditions. Uh, middle is mo moderate and the, and the right is moist. So you can see that when the shear is low and the conditions are moist, all the tropical cyclones develop. Um, when, the when the shear is high and the conditions are dry, none of the tropical cyclones develop. But if we go into the middle, uh, next slide, please. Um, we can see that, uh, th that this uh, moderately dry and moderately sheared scenario is where we have the largest uh, uncertainty in the genesis timing. So in fact, in this case, about 100 hours difference between the initial uh, uh, mem member that develops and the last member. And the only difference between the initial conditions in this case is uh, very small perturbations of less than a half gram per kilogram of precipitable or of um, boundary layer moisture. Uh, so uh, basically un unmeasurable per uh, perturbations, which implies that we have a large predictability problem in this intermediate range of shear and uh, moisture. Um, and this study is uh, currently in review uh, uh, and, and hopefully will be published soon. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so then I just wanted to uh, end with a couple of uh, uh, slides from a paper that actually was also just published this past week uh, in Geophysical Research Letters. Um, trends in global so tropical cyclone activity over the last 30 years. And um, we looked at uh, a variety of different predictors and the trends uh, in this period, which is well observed uh, due to the uh, prevalence of, of good satellite data uh, since 1990. And in the upper left hand panel here, I'm showing the, the change in shear, the trend in shear over that time period. And you can see that um, essentially in the Western Pacific uh, Indian Basin, um, and in, the, in most of the Atlantic, um, there's been no significant trends in the shear. The only place where the shear has actually been increasing is over the Central Pacific, where the large tropical upper tr tropospheric tr t tut is, the tropical upper tr tropospheric trough. Um, we do see increases, though, in the relative humidity in the Western Pacific and uh, Indian Ocean, um, and then large increases in the SST and 200 millib uh, millibar temperature. Um, the uh, bottom panel on the right, panel F, shows the uh, El Nino longitude index, uh, which has been trending towards more of a La Nina-like basis, basic state over the past 30 years, um, which has tended to uh, enhance activity in the Atlantic and suppress activity in the Pacific, despite the increasing uh, SSTs in the, in the Western Pacific. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, these are the trends from that uh, analysis, um, just some of the ones in this paper. Um, we've shown that, in fact, the accumulated cyclone energy globally has decreased slightly, um, in part due to that uh, tendency for a La Nina-like base state. 
Um, and that the, but the occurrence of rapid intensification has actually been increasing. And in particular, the red, line, red uh, dots here are incidences of rapid intensification of greater than 50 knots in 24 hours, um, which is an extreme rapid intensification, has been on the rise in part due to those increases in SST and essentially no changes in shear over the long term. And, and that has led to the, the final panel, which is the uh, increase in damage globally uh, associated with tropical cyclones, which is also associated with uh, changes in exposure along the coast. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, um, I hope it's a, been a, a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I wanted to emphasize a few key points that uh, tropical vertical wind shear is, we've known for many years it's been driven by ENSO, but uh, Rossby wave breaking has recently been shown to be a very important uh, contributor to vertical wind shear and monsoon variability on seasonal timescales. And by incorporating that Rossby wave breaking impacts, um, we can actually improve seasonal forecasts of tropical cyclones. Um, the vertical wind shear creates dynamical, dynamic, thermodynamic, and microphysical TC asymmetries. Um, and uh, we've, with polar metric radar and uh, airborne radar, we're able to dive into those mechanisms and understand those better in recent years. Um, the strong vertical wind shear is generally de detrimental to genesis, but can help organize convection and provide horizontal vorticity that can help enhance the circulation. Um, but the moderately sheared and dry environments are the ones that have the most uncertainty in genesis and, and most challenges in prediction. Um, we haven't seen any significant trends in vertical wind shear uh, globally, in the, except in the Central Pacific since 1990. But uh, increases in the sur sea surface temperatures and, and relative humidity and a trend towards more La Nina like base state results in a global decrease in uh, cumulative cyclone energy and an increase in rapid intensification. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that these interactions are in fact quite complex and they vary across many spatial and temporal scales. So I think we still need uh, quite a bit of research, but uh, hopefully I've been able to provide a summary of, of our current state of, of the science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Barrow. Uh, that were, this was a very complete review of the recent uh, relationship between the tropical cyclone and the wind shear, uh, referring to uh, very new uh, published papers, including uh, new papers. So, uh, have you uh, anyone has uh, from? Uh, we will have a couple of minutes to, for discussion. So, oh, I I can find the uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Ananda Das. Could you? Could you? Uh, and, thank you, uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, to allow me the, uh, for allowing my questions. Actually, Dr. Bell, uh, my question is that uh, you uh, selected uh, the shear and uh, mid uh, tropospheric uh, moisture. So, uh, what is that uh, depth uh, layer of uh, depth of the mid tropospheric layer? Um, we actually checked a, diff a variety of different ones, but I, I think the, ver the most sensitivity is found in the 850 to 700 millibar or hectopascal layer um, is where we see the most variability and, and the most impacts on the shear. Um, in our uh, study, um, we've, we've actually tested in the idealized study, we've tested uh, at different levels. Um, as long as it's in the lower troposphere below about 700 millibars, um, we get very similar results. But um, in, in Print in, in nature, most of the variability is is between 800 and 7, 850 and 700, just above the boundary layer, but in the still in the lower troposphere. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Extension of this one. Yes. Any other question? Or Any other question? Can I ask one question? I sh 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 who we, uh, I, I, I can't, sorry. I can't sorry. Please go ahead. Arane, please go ahead. Uh, uh, well, uh, as you explained that uh, 800 and 700 hectopascal levels are very important, which is just above the boundary layer. That means moist influx and uh, uh, the various cloud clusters uh, uh, interaction due to the vorticity is makes the uh, intensification of this uh, uh, convection in the cyclone. So the, um, the, the, in the developing disturbance in particular, um, especially in the Western Pacific, the the primary uh, vorticity maximum tends to be around 850 millibars. Um, and so what we found was that the, the storm needed to develop vertically and actually develop a mid-level circulation before genesis could occur. Um, so it needed to get to about 600, the vertical development up to around 600 uh, hectopascals 
Um, and the shear was detrimental to that. It, it knocks, it essentially displaces that mid-level vortex from the low-level vortex. And so if you add the dry air in, then that convection can't develop vertically um, and it can't help to sustain and align that vertex, vortex in the vertical. So it becomes too tilted um, and, and cannot develop. Um, so we're still trying to understand exactly the mechanisms by which that alignment and uh, subsequent uh, uh, intensification occur, but but that's what we believe is is happening is that vertical alignment um, of the of the dynamics and the moisture are required for the genesis to occur. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, I ha we have a one minute more. Okay, I will myself have a one question uh, because you mentioned about the relationship to uh, loss wheel breaking. If so. There is a preferential location uh, for the uh, such a coupling because the loss wave bre breaking often occurs in specific areas, and also loss wave breaking has a, uh, some statics uh, tight relationship to the end phase. So, uh, mm -hmm. first, first question is the uh, uh, is this my correct understanding because the uh, such coupling uh, occur in the same location, and also the second question is the. Uh, do you have any plan to the? Uh, you show also show the some end phase. So I think the uh, loss wave breaking and the end phase also couple each other. So I think the it also affects the uh, TC uh, activity. That is comment. Yes, that's a great question. Um, in fact, you're you're exactly correct that they do tend to um, be very tightly coupled, and it's it's very hard to, to separate those signals. Um, so we have a paper that we are. Um, preparing for submission now where we're using uh, the CESM large ensemble to look at periods where uh, ENSO neutral conditions and try and look at the drivers of, of Rossby wave breaking and shear in those simulations um, where the ENSO is not a factor. Um, it's challenging because the models aren't necessarily getting everything right, um, but, but we can have a larger statistical sample of the ENSO neutral conditions that can help us to understand some of those things. So um, uh, what we're finding so far is that the uh, North Atlantic oscillation um, in, in particular may be playing a role in, uh, in, in some of those variations on seasonal uh -huh. timescales. So when ENSO yeah. is not driving. So uh -huh. I, thank you. Yeah, I see. Th thanks so much. And uh, we, we expect the uh, uh, new results soon. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, Great, thank uh, you. Uh, we have to move to the uh, move on to next uh, next speaker is me. So from now I will uh, talk my speak. Okay. I will try to. Can you see my slide? Yes. 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 Okay. We can see. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, from now, uh, hi everyone. Again, I'm Kenyu Yenema from Jamstack, and uh, uh, from now the. Uh, I will talk about in my topics. Uh, actually, the also the my original uh, talks original talk title was a brief review of Jamstack YMC activities. But uh, today, actually, the, I recognize that it is difficult to talk everything within fifteen minutes. So I slightly changed the title and the focusing on the introduction of our recent attempt to study S interaction over the Western Pacific using uh, autonomous surface vehicles. Thus, I'm sorry that it is not a complete review, but a simple introduction of our activity. So from now on, I will show some basic figures obtained then to indicate the capability of the uh, using, usage of the uh, such uh, autonomous surface vehicles. Okay. But uh, uh, before showing to our results, I think... Oh, oh. Sorry. I'm not for, I'm not sure you are familiar with uh, our field count program YMC or Year of the Maritime Continent. I will briefly mention about the YMC first. The purpose of YMC is very simple. Uh, we direct to improve our knowledge of our weather climate system over the maritime continent and its global impact. This is because even now the state of the art numerical climate model or forecast model are suffering from the systematic errors or rainfall over this region, like this one. So we direct to, uh, we need, our knowledge about the uh, such system is insufficient over maritime continent region. So the uh, uh, and uh, so many uh, institutes and universities joined this campaign. Also, this pro program was. Uh, initiated to take uh, take place as a two-year field program 
but uh, mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a uh, uh, field campaign phase is extended or expanded to the uh, early next year. And uh, the unique feature of this field campaign is the YMC offers an uh, opportunity to coordinate field campaign uh, for international community to co uh, coordinate with local maritime, co uh, maritime continent, local meteorological agency. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so uh, this field campaign, uh, actually this uh, YMC consists of many uh, intensive observations. And uh, of course, as well as the long-term measurement done by the local agencies, uh, you can see the uh, uh, a left panel sh uh, a left panel shows the uh, location of the field campaign, and the right panel sh uh, right table shows the uh, period and the uh, campaign target. And uh, yeah. you can see there there are a lot of uh, field campaign, but uh, uh, but some field campaign that were uh, originally scheduled in the take place the uh, uh, last year or this year. Uh, postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, so it was so. For, at this moment, it is scheduled to take place in the early next year. And uh, we at Jamo State conducted several field campaigns in the past few years. You can see the uh, uh, before the YMC campaign. Actually, we conducted a pilot study of Sumatra Island, so uh, we conducted it twice. Uh, to study Diane cycle rain and MGO and their interaction along uh, over the Indonesia Sumatra Island area, but today I will focus my talk is focusing on the uh, uh, topics that was conducted in the uh, another campaign in the 2018 and 2020. Uh, we call its name is a Boreal Summer Monsoon Study. You can see this one. Okay. So from now on, I will briefly mention about the uh, uh, our trial to using autonomous surface vehicle from now. Yeah, but uh, actually, the our field campaign, the Boreal Summer Monsoon Society in 2018, was uh, uh, designed to study uh, this BSM, uh, and but uh, from various aspects. For example, we conducted the special radar sound observation at several sites in Vietnam and Indonesia to study the large scale meridional saturation associated with Asian monsoon. And the other uh, it was the, to study the cycle rain along the west coast, uh, northwestern coast of Luzon Island uh, associated with the uh, Boreal Summer Interseasonal Saturation. So we deployed the uh, radar as well as we conducted the uh, intense late sun sounding. But uh, uh, as I mentioned that today, my talk is focusing on the uh, our trial because during this period, we de uh, deployed such wave riders uh, over the Western Pacific region. Indeed, uh, this was the, our first trial to uh, use such a wave rider uh, to deploy several wave riders and also the attach the special sensors. Indeed. Uh, We, uh, not, uh, 2018 was a trial, but uh, 2020, uh, we also conducted the field campaign again over the same region. Uh, both campaigns, as I mentioned, that we deployed uh, such a wave grader. As you can guess from this name, uh, this uh, ASV uh, can a wave, uh, we can, uh, it can convert wave energy into propulsion. So it can cruise by them by itself. So uh, indeed, yeah, we deployed it two times for this left thing, okay. And uh, to evaluate, uh, and also, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. And uh, usually, web grader equipped with standard soft meteorological measurement system. But in addition, this, uh, one of the advantages of web grader is that we can attach the additional sensors. So we at this time we attach the GNS receiver to derive the precipitate water vapor, okay. And uh, that was uh, actually the first trial uh, to deploy the uh, GNS uh, receiver to measure the precipitate water vapor on both the uh, wave rider. 
to evaluate the reliability of pressure water vapor, when we uh, we compare such a pressure water vapor data derived of GNS on both the web writer with other data set. For example, since we all unfortunately we could not get a, a latest on sounding data on board because we cannot get a sip time. Instead, we can, can get a sounding data from Palo Island. Since we deploy the web writer from Palo Island, we can compare the uh, preserved paper data obtained by GNS and as well as the uh, later on sounding on, uh, at Palo. I'm sorry. Okay. And also we compare the uh, preserved water paper uh, with the uh, with the data obtained from the satellite base. As you can see, the, we can confirm the uh, both show the good correspondence each other. Based on this result, uh, we can confirm the uh, uh, GNS receiver can produce the uh, preserved water paper even on both the web writer. The big advantage of this technique is the uh, uh, we can obtain the such pressure water paper very high resolution. Actually, in this time, we obtained every 10 minutes. Using such advantages, for example, uh, we can check the uh, 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 we can evaluate the capability of such advantages. For example, we check the behavior when cold pool uh, event associated with the convection were observed. Following the uh, definition of the color proof uh, proposed by this Zorg, uh, we define the uh, color event uh, during this campaign, and we identify 23 events. And, uh, and uh, the result is shown in the right panel here. And uh, you can see that uh, we can clearly, sh uh, it, it clearly shows that the drastic increase of visual world vapor by five millimeters. So indicated it can be used to study mesoscale uh, convective cloud system. Yeah. So at this moment, that's all. But uh, I think the, uh, from this uh, figure, we can confirm this uh, uh, such pressure water vapor obtained by GNS is very useful to study uh, even without any uh, other later data or something, but uh, it is possible as an alternative method to uh, study the uh, S interaction, especially focusing on the convex area. And uh, in 2020, we also conducted the another field campaign at that time, we could get a safe time or our research based on Mirai, and uh, we did. And, uh, but uh, instead, due to the COVID nineteen, we could not get uh, go uh, go abroad. So we can we cancelled several field campaign in Indonesia or Philippines. Instead, we requested the local agency to enhance their radio sound sounding to capture the large scale features. So uh, partners from uh, uh, from Philippines and Palau and Yap. And they collaborated with uh, this campaign. But anyway, the main topic of this today is the, uh, the mention that we conduct the field uh, in station observation using our research vessel. At that time, we deployed the uh, three web riders and one Triton uh, more bridge system like this. Uh, within the, uh, since uh, Doppler radar is equipped on board our research vessel, uh, we can uh, monitor within this radar range like this one. And also, the important point is, uh, as you can see, this is the track of the uh, web writer. You can see that we deploy the three web writer at the same location, and we recover the web writer at the same location. It means that uh, we can obtain the data for of intercomparison in field. Okay. Here is an example of the surface methodology obtained by the uh, web writer. Uh, for example, you can see the uh, uh, rain detected. Of course, the little humidity increased and uh, while uh, surface air temperature and the sea surface uh, temperature as well as salinity uh, decrease. By comparing to the later data, we can confirm at that time the uh, compact system passed by over this region. And also, uh, we can no also notice the drastic change of wind here, like this one. Uh, we speculate this is true or not, but uh, by comparing to the uh, Doppler radar and the uh, velocity data set, we can confirm, oh, this is certainly at the time the uh, complex system passed by and the uh, wind, wind uh, direction drastically changed. So by comparing to later data as well as the uh, web grader data, 
we can obtain the uh, reliable data, but uh, this is a uh, qualitatively. Okay. Um, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, such web grader data shows unreliable data. For example, you can see this period, uh, block tree uh, pressure data safety to, uh, increase drastically. Uh, and uh, and uh, several days later, it uh, it down to the original position. Something happened. By comparing to uh, so, the next slide show the uh, uh, this is the time series of the pressure obtained by three wave graders. And uh, as I mentioned, that uh, at the beginning or the end of the uh, observation, we compare to the three wave graders. We can see that uh, they show the correspond well, but uh, uh, only this period. Uh, apparently, one wave grader show the uh, uh, diff uh, different value. Uh, we speculate this is due to the uh, uh, actually the sometimes uh, when the wave grader turn over due to the rough sea conditions, some water uh, water into into the some sensors. At the time, the, uh, it show the high pressure uh, uh, data. So, and uh, based on the. Uh, Comparison among three web writer data during this period, we determine the biases and we uh, collected them. And you can see before and after the correction, like this one. So, uh, based on this comp comparison, we collected, of course, the, not only this uh, inter comparison, but also the calibration before and after the clues, and as well as the, uh, some techniques uh, we collected and all data set. So this is an example of the quality control of the web greater surface meteorological data. You, you, oh, you can see the uh, before and after uh, we collected those data set, okay? Using collected data uh, from now, I will briefly mention about the, some uh, features observed during this field campaign. Uh, we conducted a field campaign about one month, uh, uh, 2020. At that time, the, uh, uh, all of the, this is index show the uh, uh, compact peak is not over the Western Pacific during the entire period. However, it seemed very compactively very active during the field campaign. Okay. Indeed, the, uh, it seems that there are weak, uh, weekly periodicity like this. And also at the end of the field campaign, a uh, two tropical cyclone developed near the observation area. You can see this one. Okay. Anyway, we could observe the uh, such a Ocean or atmospheric condition over this region uh, in the active air uh, period. Indeed, the uh, when we uh, next slide show the uh, time series of the uh, radar echo area. Uh, left panel show the radar echo area, and the uh, right panel show the uh, relative humidity obtained by radar sound. You can see the uh, very active area uh, as indicated by such data. We can confirm the uh, late, our radar captured well, uh, such uh, a strong and large compact area like this. But uh, comparing to the uh, later humidity by later sun, uh, of course, they also show the high moist condition when the convection developed. But uh, also, some cases uh, show the uh, no significant convection observed, but uh, uh, high moist, uh, moist condition can confirm by the uh, uh, radar sounding. Uh, such a feature can be confirmed by the uh, GN derived crystal water vapor. As you can see, oh, I'm sorry, the red line indicates the compact area observed by the Doppler radar and the black area uh, moist condition observed by uh, radar sound. You can see the, uh, uh, in addition to the compact area identified the Doppler radar, we can uh, GNS derived crystal water vapor also capture the moist air like this one, okay? And in addition, compare based on the, in, uh, uh, okay, I'll skip this one, okay? I'm sorry, due to the time limitation, I will skip this one, right? Okay. And also the previous study uh, show the uh, uh, some demonstrated relationship between convection onset and SST distribution. For example, layered carbon uh, demonstrated based on satellite derived data set that rainfall onset event occurred at the location with enhanced horizontal convergence, which is inferred by the regulation of sea surface temperature. It means that uh, uh, Rainfall event is not proportional to the uh, sea surface temperature linearly, and they prefer the around 29.5 degrees Celsius or so, and also the negative Laplacian is a favorable condition for the uh, uh, development of the convection. 
a negative la pressure means that uh, there is a peak of the sea surface temperature within calculated area, right? And so uh, since we deploy the uh, three wave graders and one marine buoy, and we have a research vessel, it means that we have five sites, so we can calculate the uh, uh, such a uh, sea surface temperature of la pressure. So uh, I know it is very difficult to detect or uh, accurate relationship between convection and uh, such a sea surface temperature of pressure. However, this light panel shows that uh, at least during this period, before the uh, strong convective area uh, occurred, appeared, uh, negative value can be confirmed. And also during the active convective period, basically uh, sea surface temperature and Laplacian shows the negative value indicating the very favorable conditions. Indeed, when we calculated the mass divergence and vorticity during using uh, such a surface metric data obtained by the web writers, we can confirm the uh, indeed the uh, uh, more uh, lower condition is very favorable for the uh, uh, development of convection like this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, when we look at the pressure field, the pressure field says that uh, 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 it seems during this one month period there are two peaks of the uh, large uh, disturbance passed by over this region, like this one. But uh, actually, the, uh, it does not correspond to the entire the complete period. I, I mean that uh, early August, we also experienced actively active complete period. But uh, when we look at the differences between several uh, wave graders, we can confirm that the, uh, uh, during this period, uh, pressure gradient, uh, actually variability of pressure gradient is very large compared to the other period. It means that uh, uh, it is a very qualitative discussion, but, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, by deploying several wave graders, we can obtain the gradient or differences such an information is very useful to detect any atmospheric uh, disturbance like this one. Okay, this is my conclusion. So uh, today I only show the uh, capability of the uh, uh, web grader and equip with the GNS derived water paper. And, uh, all, and, uh, and uh, I direct emphasize two points. One is the uh, uh, Today I show several uh, quick looks of the such observation data, but uh, uh, actually such a data already been pub uh, released to the public from our VMC website. You can enjoy using such a data freely. And also uh, we collaborate with local agencies and uh, of course we offer such a, uh, knowledge and uh, we share the, such knowledge with them and uh, hopefully they, we can continue to the collaboration beyond YMC and uh, we want to uh, see for the uh, new, new, uh, another fuel campaign in very near future. Uh, actually, uh, I have another uh, last slide. Uh, today, as I mentioned, that I briefly mentioned about the uh, introduction of uh, our recent trial, uh, introducing a new uh, instrument. To, uh, instrument. But, so I didn't mention about any scientific uh, advancement uh, through the YMC. Instead, uh, I'd like to introduce our website because currently YMC arrange, uh, organize the uh, special collection of the uh, papers uh, related to the YMC. And uh, YMC website offers such pages and uh, uh, we ask to the several uh, scientific societies and they agree to join this special collection. So far, seven society and 23 uh, journals joined this, uh, this special collection. If you look at these pages, you can find many people. Actually, even now, the 138 people have already been published in the past five years. Uh, in addition to this journal, uh, there are, of course, we also have uh, provided information about other uh, papers published as a journal. In total, 150 papers already been published. So I think the uh, it is not uh, it is easy. If you look at these pages, you can find all relevant papers. So I think the also I I did not mention about the review of the scientific advan uh, advancement, but uh, instead this page can provide you the uh, such a uh, new information obtained from the uh, YMC. That's all. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a chair, but. Uh, <laughs> And I must be a very comp uh, function, but uh, it seems that almost 20 minutes has already been. 
So if you have any question, only one quick question, if you have, or uh, if you have any question, please put uh, your question to the uh, chat, uh, chat, chat or something. Then I uh, will try to answer uh, during the, uh, later, okay? Is it okay? I'm very sorry for the, uh, uh, I'm not punctual. So, okay, uh, I will finish my talk and uh, let's move on to the next speaker. The speaker is the uh, Professor Tsuboki from Nangwe University. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Please, uh, can you hear uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Yonima-san. Uh, can you see my slide and the voice is okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay I will start uh, <clears throat> my talk. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to this very important workshop. I'm honored to uh, be here and give a talk. I'm going to talk about high resolution simulation of heavy rainfall producing mesoscale com convective system uh, using cloud resolving model. Heavy rainfall occurs in association with monsoon system such as Meiyu, Bayou, and Shurin and Chama in East Asia. Most disaster Producing heavy rainfalls are caused by mesoscale convective systems, MCS, MCS, composed of intense cumulonimbus cloud. The most important uh, MCS for disaster prevention is a stationary shaped, line shaped MCS, which are most dangerous precipitation system and often cause a heavy rainfall. And, uh, these heavy rainfall occasionally give rise to severe flood and landslides. <clears throat> cloud resolving models are indispensable for studies of the of the mechanisms and the processes, and also for accurate uh, predictions of heavy rainfall. The present paper reviews the recent simulation of heavy rainfall heavy rain producing MCS using cloud resolving models. The definition of a cloud resolving model is a slightly ambiguous. A similar uh, name is convection permitting model, CPM. The convection permitting is uh, almost uh, equal to non hydrostatic. The difference between the CRM, con cloud resolving, resolving model, and the convection per permitting model. Uh, may be related to the buoyancy term. <clears throat> the, uh, roughly saying, uh, the buoyancy term is composed of, of a dynamic uh, part uh, indicated by terms D and microphysical uh, terms, terms C. The CPM is uh, calculated explicitly term D, but uh, implicitly he calculated the term C. But on the other hand, the cloud resolving model <clears throat> uh, calculated both term D and C uh, by time dependent e equations. So the difference uh, between these two models are uh, may be uh, related to the, the expression of cloud microphysical processes. This is an example of uh, a simulation using cloud resolving model. <clears throat> the hydrometeors such as cloud water, grapple, cloud ice, snow, and rain are explicitly calculated and uh, uh, with, uh, with the dynamic process. And this type of uh, uh, cloud resolving model developed in many places, for example, MM5 and WAF developed in US and Japan Meteorological Agency developed a JMA NHM non hydrostatic model and China uh, developed GRAPE mesoscale atmospheric regional model and we also developed cloud resolving storm simulator CRES. These models are basically regional non hydrostatic model and may be categorized as a cloud resolving, resolving model. I should emphasize the importance of horizontal resolution in the simulation using cloud resolving model. 
this figure shows this figure compares the diff two different uh, horizontal resolutions. Left panel is a simulation of a, a supercell using one kilometer resolution, and right panel is 100 meter resolution. The difference uh, between these two results are very clear. At the end of in 100 meter resolution model, uh, a very detailed hook shaped structure is simulated uh, or at the uh, southern end of the uh, surface. But uh, 100 kilometer resolution simulation, the detailed structure is not uh, clearly uh, exp expressed. The difference, uh, 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 qualitative and quantitative difference, are uh, clear uh, in <clears throat> in uh, these two uh, results. So, uh, increase of resolution is very important uh, using cloud resolution model. The uh, important objective of uh, uh, the cloud res resolving model. Uh, for heavy rainfall simulation is stationary line-shaped mesoscale convective system or slow-moving uh, linear mesoscale linear uh, mesoscale convective system. These two panels shows two examples of heavy rainfall system line-shaped MCS observed uh, in Western Japan. Uh, <coughs> the later uh, image shows uh, very intense uh, line-shaped MCS over here, and uh, the uh, left right panel shows also uh, stationary uh, line-shaped MCS over here. These two uh, heavy rainfall systems cause a severe disaster over uh, Kyushu area. <clears throat> uh, to, uh, Simulation of uh, this heavy rainfall system, a line shaped, a stationary line shaped MCS is shown here. Uh, this uh, simulation is uh, successful. The, the upper uh, left panel shows a radar observation of, uh, of line shaped uh, MCS uh, developed over here and made a at the landfalling area, uh, flood due to heavy rainfall more than 300 millimeter, millimeter per nine hour. And a uh, simulation uh, in the uh, lower left panel shows uh, successful line shaped MCS uh, over here. And a cold, dry surface flow uh, was present on the northern side and uh, large moisture uh, air flow from the from the southwest and reaches to uh, the line shaped MCS here. This is uh, the simulation with one kilometer resolution, and total rainfall amount uh, in observation reaches to uh, almost 300 millimeter uh, at the land land pouring. Uh, region and simulation also shows uh, the similar uh, amount of uh, total rainfall. So uh, this uh, simulation is uh, very successful, and uh, uh, this line shift MCS uh, is uh, correctly, almost correctly simulated by a cloud resolution model. On, on the other hand. Uh, 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 this uh, heavy rainfall occurred uh, from 0 to 9 JST on July 5th. Uh, three hours later, another heavy rainfall occurs uh, very close to uh, the area. And the upper panel shows radar analysis, and uh, <clears throat> radar analysis, analysis shows uh, more than uh, 600 millimeter uh, within nine hours. Uh, but uh, the prediction using 
simulation using cloud resolving model with horizontal grid spacing of one kilometer. Uh, the, to the maximum rainfall amount is uh, very much lower than the observation. Uh, the maximum is uh, roughly one third. So uh, this uh, heavy rainfall system is not successfully so uh, low predictability of prediction. <clears throat> These two examples of a heavy rainfall system occurred in a very close area and uh, uh, almost uh, the same time, in the same day. Uh, the, these two examples indicate that heavy rainfall, uh, some rain, rainfall systems are successfully simulated uh, using high resolution cloud resolving, resolving model, while others are uh, very difficult to be simulated. To solve this, uh, this problem, recently radar observation is uh, assimilated in the, uh, uh, to the model. This is one example uh, of a simulation using uh, 500 meter simulation. The left panel shows the radar observation and precipitation occurs over here. <clears throat> and the middle panel shows simulation without data uh, assimilation of radar data. Almost no simulation, no precipitation uh, is simulated. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, right panel shows simulation with data assimilation. This result is uh, the result is totally different from the middle panel and uh, almost uh, correctly simulated the distribution of precipitation. This uh, result indicates uh, the uh, radar data uh, assimilation is uh, promising for uh, the simulation of heavy rainfall system. This is another uh, example the uh, top panel shows a radar uh, observation of a convective cells. And the middle middle layer, uh, middle level is radar ex ex external uh, polarization uh, forecast. The shape is very much different from the radar observation. The bottom uh, line shows the uh, press class uh, three dimensional uh, uh, data assimilation using variational three dimensional uh, variational assimilation using one kilometer resolution. The uh, convective cells uh, shown in observation is almost correctly uh, uh, simulated. And recently, a very uh, high temporal resolution uh, uh, radar observation is used for or data assimilation. Uh, this is the result of uh, one minute volume scan uh, data assimilation in one kilometer grid uh, experiment. Uh, left uh, column shows observation and the uh, right column is assimilation. The convective cells is correctly, almost correctly simulated. So this result uh, shows uh, very rapid up, update of uh, uh, radar data is uh, very uh, useful, uh, very important for uh, uh, correct uh, uh, sim successful simulation of this this type of convective cells. And recently, a phased array radar is developed. The, the conventional radar observed uh, using a very narrow beam. So it, 3D observation takes uh, five minutes to 10 minutes. So uh, it takes a long time. But uh, phase array later uses farm beam. So 3D scans with 100 uh, elevations takes uh, 10 to 30 seconds. So uh, very rapid of the volume scan uh, observation is this uh, possible. This is a polarimetric 
a, a three-dimensional display of uh, uh, observation hailstorm uh, in Tokyo area using polarimetric phase array radar. Uh, very detailed uh, evolution of convective cells or uh, convect uh, or precipitation core in convective cells is, can be observed. The data interval is 30 seconds. So uh, using this high resolution uh, uh, phase array radar uh, is now deployed uh, in some area in Japan. Two pairs of Doppler phase array radar is located in Tokyo and the Osaka area, and single phase array radar is uh, is located in main island of Okinawa. And uh, polarimetric phase array radar is also uh, developed is also located in Tokyo area. Uh, using the two pair of uh, phase array Doppler uh, phase array data in, in Osaka area. Uh, 30 second update, uh, 100 meter mesh uh, data simulation uh, to simulate isolated convective system is uh, performed by Majima et al. The left column shows phase array data observation and uh, every 10 minutes. So a uh, convective system developed over here. Without uh, <coughs> data simulation, this convective system is not uh, uh, simulated totally. The one kilometer uh, result uh, shows uh, roughly it shows uh, the, the convective system. But uh, data simulation with 100 meter resolution shows uh, very detailed structure uh, 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 is simulated. Uh, so the result is uh, very similar to the observation. In summary, a stationary line shaped MCS is most dangerous precipitation system. Uh, in the previous uh, this workshop, we showed uh, a summary of a recent development, recent uh, simulation using a cloud resolving model, horizontal resolution of one to four kilometer. And uh, this presentation, we updated uh, uh, the review. As I showed, uh, some heavy rainfall system were successfully simulated using CRM, while others are difficult. Uh, to solve this pro uh, problem, a promising method is an assimilation of radar data. Recently, phase array with the radar uh, has been developed, and uh, uh, polarimetric phase array radar also developed. Phase array radar uh, expe uh, is expected to possibility to improve the uh, simulation of heavy rainfall uh, producing MCS by data assimilation. Okay, thank you for your uh, attention. I stop here. Thank you, Professor Tsuburki, for a uh, nice talk and uh, presenting the uh, uh, new research topic, and uh, especially for the showing the uh, results obtained by phase R later. That is very uh, hot topics. Okay. Anyone else? Any question or comment to Professor Tsuburki? Oh, oh Dr. Kalparai. Very nice talk by Professor Abu. So I would like to ask that what the page array weather radar i really impressed with it what uh, parameters of this pwr uh, will be used for a simulation in your model uh yes uh, actually phase array uh, polarimetric phase array later observed many different parameters but up at present uh velocity uh, and the reflectivity uh assimilated but in the future, as a parameter, in the future, yeah. as a parameter. Uh, we'll you mean to say reflectivity, reflectivity, JDE, and, and the uh, Doppler velocity, radial velocity. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, radial velocity. Yes. So, do you know that any other experience for such a data simulation in other uh, occurring or any other scientist? Uh, 
I mean, the other issue to do, do the same one or not? Do you have any idea? Uh, uh, within Japan? Uh, no, no, in, in any, yeah. Uh, outside of Japan, maybe a, <clears throat> in US, uh, is really the, uh, is, uh, assimilated. Uh, mm, maybe some other hydro, non hydrostatic model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any other question to Professor Tsuboki or any comment or something? Okay. Okay, just in time. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to the next okay, speaker. Thank you. thank you, bro. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is the uh, last speaker of this session is a uh, Professor uh, Terao from Kanga University, Japan. Uh, he will introduce the JVX uh, AJPEX collaboration toward understanding of the multi scale variability of the Asian hydroclimatological system. Professor Terao, how is yours? <clears throat> Thank you very much. So now I'd like to share my slides, okay? Can you see my it slide? Okay. It works. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm Tor Terao from Kago University in Japan. And so I like to talk about a, a new project I launched in 19, uh, 2019. Uh, the name is ASIAPEX, ASEAN Precipitation Experiment. So this is a kind of successor of a game project and Mahashi project. And we are now beginning our uh, discussion and we have some preliminary results. Uh, from our research activity. So I'd like to show uh, some uh, perspectives of our project and uh, some result and also future perspectives also. And we are under the, the WCRP perspective. And so GUX is a very important panel within the, the WCRP, as you know. And in GX, there are four panels. And so our panel is in the GHP, GHP here. So this is very much related with land atmosphere interaction. And so uh, we are so much uh, associated with that land atmosphere coupling. And within this uh, GHP uh, panel, uh, there are several uh, uh, GHPs, but we, uh, RHP, sorry. Regional hydrochromatic project. And ASEAPEX is one of the, the project uh, is in the ASEAN area. So it, it can cover all the ASEAN region. So we can uh, discuss about the, the ASEAN monsoon impact and how it is related with the land surface processes. And so we're now uh, beginning this project in this area. And we discussed and we set our uh, general objective uh, like this, uh, the understanding of ASEAN land precipitation of uh, diverse hydroclimatological conditions. And it is for better prediction and disaster, disaster reduction and sustainable development. And so, uh, and also we've set six approaches to, uh, to our research project and six approaches like this. First one is uh, associated with observation and estimation of the precipitation itself. So it can uh, uh, include direct observation and also that the uh, remote sensing also included. And second, second one is uh, the process study of uh, atmosphere and coupling. So land surface process is very important. How it is coupled with the convective process is also very important for this process study. And third one is the predictability of uh, sub-signal to signal scale to decadal variability. And the fourth one is the high resolutional uh, hydrological modeling, including human impact and also glacier uh, processes also. And fifth one is the synergy effect so we will we will uh, conduct some uh, field campaign including observational and modeling initiatives in near future so this is very important uh, topic 
about our research uh, project. And the sixth one is somewhat uh, our, uh, very important for that the now uh, global warming is going on. So we like to uh, seek effective and useful climate projection also. It may be, it's also a very important topic of our research. And uh, this time we are taking the approach-oriented research plan, not the regional approach. So uh, there are many, many different uh, approaches are there. So these approaches, firstly, uh, we have to focus and we can apply these approaches to different areas. So we are uh, taking this approach-oriented research plan this time. We had uh, conducted a kickoff conference in 2019 uh, in Hokkaido, Japan. So we had uh, uh, 72 presentations and from 10 countries. And we are now uh, uh, summarizing some review paper and uh, it is now submitted to our journal. So maybe I expect that in the near future we can see that the, the publication And we have many research recent activities, but it is somewhat very difficult within this COVID-19 situation, but we had many workshops and uh, 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 sessions in many uh, conferences also. This is a uh, one uh, workshop held in South Asian region. It is in Rajasthan, India. And we had a, a, another uh, session in the AOGS 2021, and uh, we had a, a top combina hours. And so it was uh, selected as one of the five uh, most popular sessions in AOGS 2021. And we had a webinar in the uh, summer uh, association, and we had a very good discussion there. And in future also, we had a JPG session uh, in this May, and also we are planning a joint session with TPE and UX uh, in the AOGS 2022 in August also. And the UX and the GSP panel has uh, several goals, and so there are many important goals relevant to our Asia PECs. So one is the observation and the estimation of uh, precipitation itself, and also process studies on the land surface and convective process is also very important. And predictability is also a very important topic about the GSP perspective. And so I'd like to introduce some of our uh, recent uh, uh, first results uh, regarding these three topics. Observation and estimation, we had uh, several uh, important uh, research results uh, from different people, in the, including our uh, research activity. And this is the uh, ultra high resolution dissolving twin peer climatology uh, created by uh, Hirose san and Okada san in 2018. So it is open to public. We can use anytime uh, their climatology now. Uh, it has uh, climatology with uh, 0 0.01 degree uh, resolution in uh, spatial resolution. Uh, so it is very important to see that the uh, small scale variability in the related with the, the very complex topography. This is the southern side of the Meghalaya Plateau. It is the just north of Bangladesh, the Indian region. And there is a very uh, strong rainfall uh, with a world record, more than 11,000 mm per uh, year in annual climate. But this is another one. It is from the satellite. Uh, I imagine it all try to uh, estimate the drop side distribution using DPM, DPR radar. And process studies are also very important. Uh, there are many related research results uh, from this activity. And Teramura et al. Uh, detected the impact of land surface hot heterogeneity to the mesoscale convective system uh, formation. 
So they find that the surface temperature heterogeneity is very important uh, for that the formation of mesoscale convex systems. And this is the uh, China, Chinese region, and this is the northeastern part of China, which is Mongol. And they found uh, when uh, the topography is very flat at that time, that the, the, this uh, temperature heterogeneity acts very important uh, role uh, in the, the formation of uh, mesoscale convective systems. And Orguera et al. 2020 uh, make a, a very important research analysis about the, the mesoscale, uh, sorry, uh, synoptic scale uh, disturbances related with the, the Philippine rainfall. <clears throat> and this is predictability studies. And uh, so this is the Takahashi et al. Uh, they uh, uh, estimated the future change uh, of the climate uh, using climate model output, and they uh, estimated that the increase in the uh, monsoon trough uh, rainfall. And also, uh, this enhancement is explained by the future changes, tropical disturbances activity. So uh, this is very important uh, for the future projection of climate change. And Takaya-san is uh, doing very important uh, research about the, the impact of the, the climate, climate models uh, and the prediction of uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, uh, prediction. And this is the uh, main front rainfall prediction uh, using the climate models. They found that the, in Japan, Japan area and the somewhat the East China Sea, there is a very strong activity of the rainfall in 2020 by season. And it can be uh, predicted uh, that the, the since April, uh, so they, uh, they have some uh, very uh, reading time about the uh, climate uh, model uh, prediction. And they also try to uh, find the predictability of climate models. And uh, so they uh, discovered that, that the rainfall in the Asian monsoon region uh, is, uh, can be uh, predicted even one year ahead. So, so at that time, so that the key uh, uh, phenomena about this uh, predict predictability is and so IPOC mode is, a, as you know, it is very much covered between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So the oceanic area is very important predictor about that this uh, strong rainfall in the uh, Asian monsoon region. So uh, this uh, oceanic area also, area also very important impact impact on that the land, uh, land uh, precipitation processes. And Hatsuzuka et al. also try to uh, predict, uh, project that future uh, impact of climate change uh, in the impact of uh, tropical cyclones in the uh, Japanese area. And they found that the northern side of the, the, this island, Japanese island, has very impact uh, on the climate change. So this is a very important future projection also. And there are many observation projects under the, the JPEX. And one is the Hyplex. It is uh, related with the uh, southern slope of uh, Himalayan uh, range. And uh, they are uh, putting many rain gauges is in some valleys. And so they are making the direct observation of the rainfall. And also how this is changing in the uh, diurnal uh, time scales. And they are analyzing what is the cause of this uh, different type of uh, diurnal variability in the rainfall in the southern slope of uh, Himalayan range. And Jahe is related with the uh, Sumatra Island, ah, sorry, uh, to Java Island. And so they are uh, very much concentrated on the uh, um, urban uh, flux uh, in 
this Jakarta area. A new observation project has been launched by Somon Project, and they are doing uh, that the uh, Bio Benga or the Benga Plain area uh, observational project. And they are focusing on the high moist static energy air mass in the lower troposphere uh, with the uh, equivalent temperature larger than 355 kelvins. And this very high, very moist and very uh, hot air is accumulated in the lower portion of the atmosphere in the Bangladesh, uh, Bengal area. And so it can very much impact, very big impact on the monsoon mechanism itself. So these are very high, highly moist and humid, and also very uh, high temperature uh, air mass is very important uh, driver for the monsoon uh, circulation. So they are beginning this uh, project, and it will continue up to 2026. And they will make uh, observations in the uh, Bay of Bengal and Assam region uh, using radio observations and GPS applied to the water and also automatic weather stations. And they will make observations of soil moisture also. So they are uh, focusing on this uh, high, highly moist area, highly moist area, moist air within the lower part of the uh, atmosphere in the over the, uh, the southern region. And based on these activities, we are now planning to uh, begin discussion about the future uh, observational and modeling initiatives uh, in the ASEAN land areas. And uh, so uh, this project may have these objectives to obtain ground-based observational data set to share, and they will, it will improve predictability in regional summer winter monsoon precipitations and the extremes in the time scale longer than a week. And so we are now thinking about that the two phases will be needed. So because of that COVID-19 problem, so still we are now uh, under the recovery phase. So the phase one may uh, uh, focus on that the recovery and it will be uh, from 2023 to 2025. And after that, under the discussion of this, uh, our uh, research community, and we can launch uh, that the intensity observation period from 2025 to 27. So we may have some planning conference uh, in 2023 or so, and uh, we may uh, seek as a funding source for that these uh, intensive observations. And uh, we will discuss about that the what is that our target, and we can uh, conduct this very big activity about the Asia monsoon research uh, and uh, observation research. So this is our future plan. So we can discuss uh, from now, and uh, we can uh, find very good focus and uh, of this uh, research uh, plan. So this acknowledgement. Well, thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Terao. Uh, any anyone have a question to Professor Terao? We have a couple of minutes. Okay. No more raise your hand. I have a small question because uh, uh, let's see the last slide. You show the uh, uh, planning of the field project, and uh, yeah, at least I understand the Amy too. For example, uh, you considering the current situation, the COVID nineteen. So maybe the IOP will be extended to the twenty five or twenty six, but. Uh, or for the previous one, so so long or something, or any other project is uh, seem to be happened in the recent years. If so, mm -hmm. it's completely rely on the uh, such observation done by the uh, local scientists or something. So how do you arrange such a field campaign, mm -hmm. or do you have any perspective? Because the uh, yeah, completely changes. Mm -hmm. 
from before before the COVID nineteen. So we when we conduct the field campaign, we always think about the, how to manage, how to conduct this campaign. In such cases, collaboration or understanding by local staff or local scientists uh, most important point, I think. So thank you very much. A very important point. And so this is very uh so nicely done in the YMC. So maybe I'd like to uh, learn from the YMC project also. And uh, uh, as I show uh, you uh, several uh, projects like this and this, and so I think uh, we are uh, kind of that the uh, groups uh, of the many groups are there within our, our plan. And so, for example, I'm so much engaging in this solo project, and so we are now have very good collaboration with the local people, uh, including the meteorological agencies in these countries. So, likewise, uh, the, the, there are so huge uh, perspectives in the Asia Pacific. It is all Asia. So, uh, so each uh, different field project uh, uh, launched in these different areas have very important uh, activities in these areas. And so, uh, likewise, uh, this uh, local activity is important in one hand. So, for this uh, project, we have that the IOP from 2023 to 24 is now plan plan phase. So maybe this activity has to be done uh, with a collaboration with uh, many uh, local agencies. And now we're thinking about two phases. The first one will be that the very different uh, activities should be included. And so in these activities, uh, we have that the, uh, for each has very uh, important collaboration with the local people uh, in this project. And so within this uh, project, uh, we may have some planning conference within 2023 or so. So within that conference, we may have a big discussion about the field campaign, including the, the, the local agencies. So using this uh, mechanism, we may uh, make some collaboration, collaborative uh, atmosphere within this uh, city. So likewise, we are now um, Approaching to the the IOP from beginning 2025. It's my plan. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, I, I think the uh, although the, you mentioned the Asia Pex, but uh, it, it, there is no any border for science and also the planning. So I think the, uh, you can collaborate many other projects or uh, any other scientists. I think the many people can be involved. So in future. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think, yeah, thanks Bye. so much. Okay. Anyone else about any question or comment? So I think the almost time. So I think the uh, uh, we need to close this session. Uh, thank you for all speakers uh, for informative uh, providing informative topics, and uh, also the uh, it, at least I believe that it's very inspiring for future direction. Uh, so we adjourn this session, and the next session will short, uh, start shortly. Right? Okay. So uh, although we will end this session, but uh, hopefully uh, we can enjoy another uh, next session soon. Okay. Uh, I will return to this. Uh, to the local community members. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kunio, for nicely conducting the session. And we are also in time. And with this, we concluded the first uh, invited session. Now, uh, there is a short oh, break. There is a short break. break. Two parallel sessions will be Two there. Parallel okay. Will be okay. And all be. So, uh, start that at 10.10. 10. So, just there is a break of five. Ten so minutes from 10, 10. Let us see at 10. Another 8 minutes from now. Okay, so we'll have a breakout. Hall A and Hall B. Sir, Patnai, sir. Ah. Small question. Sir. Uh, small request. Can I try for sharing now? Hello, sir. Aapka unmute hai. Unmute kare. When I am speaking, okay, okay, we'll do it. Okay. Sir, this session will hear this link this will continue link for Hall A for and uh, other for Hall B. Can, can I share now and uh, test it? I would like to share for uh, just one minute. 
आपका आवाज तो नहीं आ रहा है मधु यू कैन ट्राई नॉट अ प्रॉब्लम मधु यू कैन ट्राई या ओके सर आई हैव टू टेक द स्क्रीन राइट कंप्लीट स्क्रीन या फुल स्क्रीन या 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 कैन यू चेक द हॉल पी एंड द दिस आल्सो वर्किंग ऑन द हॉल Uh, thank you yes sir sir i think with my chair i am showing yeah sir visible no? my presentation yes sir yes sir yes sir is it visible and is moving yes yes is it moving yes yes sir yes yeah thank you thank you so so i look so, so we'll join i'll stop sharing now Yeah, Professor Sigida, we have downloaded your file, sir.
so good morning good afternoon good evening so we we'll start it and but just let us one or two minutes wait it what maybe some people are joining good morning patnaik yeah so how many i think all of in your session i think all of the speaker are available yes yes i see them it is there i think so i see this oh. yeah Uh, one person I'm um, not saying. Chinna Satchina Raina. Satchina Raina not saying? No. Maybe. Uh, we have also not got any PPT. Let me check if we uploaded the PPT or not. Uh, Dr. Satnarayana joined. Okay, so now we will start the parallel session and uh, actually parallel hall B also there on field experiment and soft signal to signal prediction, but some people those are interested can join hall B also. So now may I request our uh, coordinator, session coordinator, chair, Dr. Surya Chandra Rao to kindly chair the session and uh, he is a well known figure and he will be also talking uh, invited talk. So I'll introduce in a much better way, sir, during next time. So over to you, sir, now. Thank you, Patnaik, and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me this yes, opportunity. Yes. Uh, so good morning uh, to all of you. Good morning to all of you. Good morning to all of you. And good evening to some other colleagues. Good so let us start. So, let us start. So in this session, so in this session we have six uh, presentations. Uh, presentation. And all of them are here. All of them are here. Some, uh, Madhu Chanda, you please switch to your mic when you are not using. Madhu. Mike, Madhu. Ah, okay. Now it is better. Okay. So we have a six talks, and they are very interesting talks are lined up. So as you know, there will be ten minutes for each presentation and two minutes for discussion. So I will uh, ping you if you are crossing your time of. 10 minutes. Okay. So our first speaker will be Deve Gede Ariputra from Indonesia. He will be talking about identify cloud cover zones in Indonesia. So please start your presentation, Ariputra. Yes, I'm here. Thank you for the time. I will share my screens. Yeah, screen is seen now. Okay. Thank you for the times. I will uh, present my research, identify cloud cover zone in Indonesia. This is a collaboration research under Satrep's uh, project. I'm from Indonesian Agency for uh, for Meteorological, Meteorological and Geophysics. Now I'm studying in Kagoshima University. So this is the member uh, my research. So many people uh, join this uh, research, but this is the preliminary study. For uh, my thesis. Okay, uh, this is the introductions. So, uh, um, my research is, is focused for the climate applications, uh, especially for the influence the climate for the buildings. So, this is the 
uh, introductions, uh, the reason of low carbon emissions uh, it is uh, very important to the Paris agreements under United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. And then, uh, studying uh, cloud covers condition is important for assessing the potential for the selection of the suitable acid descent concepts in Indonesia. For example, uh, building lightnings and building cooling potentials. And then, to order the to prevent the global warming, energy conservation uh, building is essential. And then, study cloud cover zones uh, necessary to realize it. And then, this research is uh, first cloud cover zones contribution for the passive cooling in Indonesia. Then, this is the uh, research flow. So, uh, for the for this research, I using uh, using cloud covers uh, elements, weather elements uh, from the synoptic, synoptic data, uh, starting from uh, twenty. 14 until 2020 for uh, seven years with the octas units in Indonesia and then uh, for the for the uh, data and uh, selected the data availability above uh, 70 percent uh, and then uh, this is uh, very important for the for the calculations because uh, uh, with uh, with the many missing data we cannot uh, doing a simulation for the calculations and then uh convert the observation data from the utc to the indonesian local time zones so indonesia have a three time zones on uh, time zone nations this is a west part of indonesia and then this is center part of indonesia and then this is a uh, east part of indonesia this is the difference from the west uh, difference uh, seven hours from the utc and then this is center difference eight hours and then is a uh, difference uh, nine hours so we must convert uh, from the UTC to the, the local time zone and then make a cluster analysis using what's methods for the weather elements and then uh, convert from the point to the contour mapping using the interpolations this is the method in first distance wage widget uh, for all of the Indonesia and then make a heat map analysis of the each of the zones then uh, I show the the selected uh, criteria for the data. You can see this is the the uh, the graphs about the missing data. This is a percentage of uh, missing data. You can see this is the high high uh, missing data uh, cannot using for the calculations. So the first uh, we uh, use uh, 130 stations, but after we uh, we selected uh, become one uh, 107 uh, station using this research. This is the distribution the missing data. So we uh, use the missing data below the 30 percent for the calculations. And then this is the uh, distribution station using for the uh, analysis. Uh, you can see this is uh, overlay with the uh, altitude data. So the altitude data is very important. You can see this is the, the, the west part of Indonesia. This is the mountain. mountain, and uh, So the, the altitude is a very uh, important influence to the weather conditions. So uh, I consider to, to using the altitude data to, to combination with this uh, observation data. The, uh, the, the altitude data uh, from uh, Etopo once from NOAA. Then this is uh, uh, the quality checks for the data. Uh, this is the hourly data. You can see I, I pick up four stations. This is, uh, for example, Pontianak. You can see this is the hourly hourly this uh, hourly pattern uh, for the cloud covers from uh, 2014 until 2020. You can see this is in Pontianak is uh, equatorial. The cloud cover is uh, very high throughout the years. You can see this is, and then another samples. Uh, uh, this is from Makassar. You can see the the uh, the fluctuations, the uh, seasonal pattern 
from this this uh, stations and then this is a uh, uh, sample for then pasar then pasar locations and then this is for lombok uh, station you can see this is the very important because uh, observation data is uh, sometimes uh, we we must calibrate the instruments and then we must uh, check the trend for the for the age of the the time series because the the uh, if the not not good uh, pattern we cannot using for the calculations then this is the result uh, for the using uh, cluster analysis you can see this is the the dendrogram we make a uh, four four regenerations this is a result uh, for the all stations you can see this is the zone one green uh, result is a uh, 33 stations this is the distribution uh, based on cluster analysis in the uh, green green points and then red point uh, distribution in this area and then uh, orange point distribution in this area and then uh, blue blue points we can see clearly the distribution in south part of indonesia this is very interesting based on cluster analysis uh, this donation is very uh, interesting and then uh, because this is a point we uh, we must uh, convert to the uh, contour map because uh, we uh, want to know uh, if this blank area we not get information so we must convert to the the contour maps to get the uh, get the information uh, the zones after after we convert you can see the the clearly clearly uh, zones in indonesia so this is uh, in equatorial location and then this is south part of indonesia and then this area in blue area in uh, center south of indonesia this is import uh, influence uh, with the australians uh, weather conditions and then this is a uh, result uh, for the age of the zonations uh, this is a cc code cover once this is a uh, you can see in in green area means this this heat map and other so uh based based on this heat map you can see the pattern of uh, the diurnal, diurnal pattern and seasonal pattern this is uh the vertical axis is uh hourly hourly diurnal uh then uh, the horizontal axis this is uh only from january january until december you can see this is uh, for example in in this area in the blue area the the decrease of uh cloud covers occur in june August, September, October, November, and uh, this is the session uh, is the dry session in this area. So make a low cloud cover in this, this session. But in December, January, and February, you can see this is an increase of the cloud cover. So this is a clearly pattern uh, for this area. And then in this area, in the green area, in the equatorials, in the zero latitudes, you can see this is uh, for the DR, diurnal and seasonal is a uh, very very high total cloud covers and then in this area in in a uh, south part of indonesia in chocolate area you can see this is a uh, decrease same with uh, zone zone four but this is still have a cloud cover uh, for example june june august and september this is decrease but uh, still a little cloud cover but in this area very very clearly dry session in this area and so long time long time for the the dry session and then uh wet session in uh december january and february but in in a uh, zone two in red area red area this is a uh, totally very high cold covers during the diurnal and and uh, seasonal so uh for the diurnal we can see this is a uh, the the day times is uh, more higher cloud cover than the night times. So this is uh, the the local local condition influence to the the diurnal conditions in in this area. Okay, I, I think uh, enough my presentation. This is the conclusions. So uh, based on the uh, cloud cover zone analysis, uh, we we divided. Uh, 
four zonations, and then uh, CC4, this is uh, in Nusa Tenggara, Sulawesi Islands of Indonesia, and then uh, with small cloud cover and uh, uh, the little cloud cover during periods from March to October, and then CC1 and CC2 uh, almost in equatorial equatorial islands in Indonesia, and then CC3 uh, it is uh, in south part of Indonesia, and uh, decrease of uh, cloud covers uh, occur in June, July, and August sessions. I think enough my presentation. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Ariputra, for a very nice talk. Uh, any questions from audience? I don't see anything in the chat box. So it's a very good study. And thanks a lot. And our next speaker will be Madhuchandra Ray from. Can I share my screen? Yeah, Madhu, you can share your screen. Yeah, yes, sir. Is it visible, sir? Yes, yes, it is visible now. Yes, sir. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. So here I would like to share the, some of the results of the uh, field observation and observation campaigns. Uh, uh, especially the first Indian cloud radar uh, uh, cloud vertical structure and its importance for the ISM. So my contributors are this Kanya, Srinivas, and people and Vinu Nair. So I'm presenting this, this NCR algorithm. So this is the abstract I have given for it. The final thing what you have to check is the observation vertical structure of the cloud, how it can be used for the modeling in the point of view of macrophysical and microphysical dynamically controlled microphysics and study the scientific observational basis for testing ISM cloud parameter schemes. So this is uh, uh, the ISM Indian summer monsoon comes as a active and break spells and uh, during the active monsoon we are excess of uh, rainfall so like uh, 12 is an anomaly and you can see the central India uh, uh, west coast and the Gujarat is having uh, excess things during the active spell whereas the break thing it's opposite its uh, dry conditions will be there. The star place is the uh, wherever I showing that is the radar location from where these uh, four years of observations we have utilized. During active monsoon time for a continuous three days if the rain is exceeding the climatological mean that we call as active and if it is a deficit below that uh, one sigma then we will call it as a break day. So this is is the important backdrop. And the another backdrop is that the vertical structure of the cloud. We have the cloud base to cloud height we call as a cloud height or the cloud vertical structure. If you can see there is a three different uh, convective clouds, shallow clouds and, a, uh, 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 and another one is a deep convection. So whereas the Johnson has found out that the trimodal cloud that is the uh, mixed phase of the um, uh, moderate height like like up to 8 kilometers is the cumulus congestors. So cumulus, shallow cumulus, cumulus congestors and cumulonimbus. These three will be, will be there in in the summer monsoon region. And Krishna and Bhagme has already told that there are the nine components associated with the monsoon. One is indirectly they are telling is the vertical structure of the cloud according to the type of convection. Thus the warm clouds and uh, mixed phase clouds and the ice phase clouds. And this is what we are going to discuss. So radar is an important tool to capture the cloud particle sizes, especially the, uh, the 35 gigahertz radar, which is an 8 millimeter wavelength radar, could be sensitive to the cloud droplets, which is in nanometers from 10 micro, uh, sorry, in micrometers, 10 micrometers to 1000 micrometers will be the cloud droplet size range. So with a reflectivity, which is the proportional to the size power, size in millimeter power of 6. So that's why we'll get the reflectivity. So reflectivity is a direct parameter to be used at the vertical profile of a cloud through a reflectivity, but vertical profile of reflectivity we are using to infer the cloud vertical structure. So we are having a cloud radar uh, and a centimeter wavelength radar, expand radar over the Western Ghat region. So till the last year, so this cloud radar, that means KASPR, CASPR, uh, 
so which is 35 gigahertz wavelength uh, radar and this radar is sensitive for the uh, water bodies in the atmosphere whether they may be a cloud hydrometeors or maybe a water bodies uh, like like a birds or insects so we have to first segregate the meteorological genuine meteorological reflectivity coming from not the non meteorological things like biota those has to be segregated by our in house developed algorithm and we find the cloud vertical structure to a reflectivity profile this red profile is there it is called the reflectivity and if we are having a sensitivity of minus 50 uh, dbg to uh, to a 20 Uh, things which can give the cloud base to the cloud height with the reflectivity profile and uh, as it is a doppler so we can get the radial velocity which in uh, vertical looking it can be used as the fall velocity of the updrafts and downdrafts if it is uh, not hydrometeor time and it can be also used a uh, linear depolarization ratio so which will tell about the homogeneous and inhomogeneous region and clearly it can identify If especially at zero degree isotherm, you will have a mixed phase. So the phase change it can able to identify. So and it is having a velocity, reflectivity, various other parameters can be used to profile the atmosphere. So through reflectivity, if you having used the reflectivity during the wet phase of the monsoon, you can see the dotted arrow. So if it is coming above that, we can say that at the local wet phase. are the local dry phase are active and break monsoon and if you can use the radial velocity it is in the other way if it is less than minus uh, uh, 3 uh, meters per second so we will consider them as a dry phase or above that is the active phase similar way so spectral width also can be used the three are these are the three main important uh, first um, uh, zeroth moment uh, moments of the radar can be used to segregate the thing and if such vertical profile vertical structure of the clouds if you span it for 60 days during the monsoon time you can able to find out the there will be a shallow clouds which cloud tops are not reaching more than 3 to 4 kilometers and the mixed phase region that is zero degree asymptom to below 40 degree asymptom is a mixed phase region where the uh, it is completely void of the cloud however when the clouds are able to grow because of the uh, boundary layer um uh, humidity fluxes and uh, growing up then the clouds can grow into cumulus congestus and sometime you can see there is a cirrus clouds but uh, they are omnipresent however they are growing down and uh, it is called the descending cirrus which will handshake with the this uh, mid level moistening and which can able to grow a deep convection like this so the cloud base is from 1 km to max Maximum up to 15 to 16 kilometers. So this is the importance of the cloud vertical structure with which we can connect to the uh, the rainfall at the surface. So that means one step back to the rainfall observations, which is the last one decade of the monsoon uh, studies have progressed with the rainfall surface rainfall. If you go one step back about the cloud vertical structure, we can able to understand the pinpoint what is contributing the surface rainfall, whether it's a shallow cloud or the Uh, cumulus congestion or deep convection and what is the role of boundary layer uh, humidity fluxes from bottom and the descending cirrus from the top so this is the importance of the cloud. so here is a one example during the active monsoon time the cirrus cloud is descending and their reflectivity is increasing mean their size is increasing and because the size is increasing the fall velocity of that the particle thermal fall velocity will increase and sometimes it will be escape from the base of the clouds that is called sedimentation the bigger ice particles which will be used to seed the warm clouds below the 5 kilometers so that is what the contribution of during active monsoon time ice clouds contribute a, our rainfall at the surface ice clouds contribution is very much seen and if you see the fall velocities are in the order of more than minus 3 meters per second during active may active phase of the monsoon whereas the break time if you see the uh, the cirrus clouds don't come below 8 kilometers that means they just stay there and uh, large scale uh, wave amplitudes you can see they are cirrus clouds and the reflectivity is also not growing more than minus 10 and the velocities are around zero that indicates that ice clouds are not have an ice cloud presence is there but they are not contributing to the surface rainfall and our Uh, macro physical profile retrieval from this radar can also shows that during active phase the ice water content and uh, liquid water content and are the very dominant in the lower in their lower regions for the ice water around uh, 6 to 6 to 5 km 
uh, five to six km region, whereas the liquid water content at two to three kilometers, they are very high. Whereas in the break monsoon, serous presence is there. But however, that is only uh, around 20% things. So which is, is what is uh, macrophysical uh, profiling of these things we have done. However, uh, we are interested to extend from the Western Ghats region our cloud radar observations. However, we don't have this uh, cloud radar so the India. Uh, so we used the cloud set of observations for last nine years and we found that uh, the central Indian region and Western Ghats region are clouds. The cloud vertical source from cloud set is co compared with our ground based observation, it is working good. Even active monsoon, it is like this, and break monsoon, the mid tropospheric uh, region, uh, mid level regions are white. Madhu, you have to and break. Same thing, yeah, yeah, yeah I complete. So, the take home message is during active and monsoon time, cloud vertical structure can be used to understand the, the monsoon, various phases, the vigor of the monsoon, and types of clouds also can be classified. And using cloud vertical structure, the active and break monsoon, the instant TNS of the things we can understand. The future scope is better. The metropospheric visited phase regions causes a secondary phase production. You can see the high level serous clouds descending down and causing a huge reflectivity uh, in the mid levels, causing a heavy amount of rain at the surface. So, this is our future study using uh, things. And also, cloud to rain transition can be studied using this uh, cloud water structure information. That is the importance of this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madhu. Interesting observations. But, uh, time is very short now. Time is very short. Ask for questions. We'll go to the next uh, presentation. We'll go to the presentation. Dr. D.R. Patnaik. D.R. Patnaik. Himself is the convener of this. Himself is the convener of this. So, Patnaik, please share. Patnaik, please share. And you'll be talking about. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Is it visible, sir? Yes, yes, Patnag. Yes, Patnag, I can see. Yes, Patnag, I can see. So, yes, uh, yeah, this is a. Uh, on, uh, can you switch up, Madhu? Your screen. Please switch up, Mike. Please switch up, Mike. Okay. Okay, so no, my topic is variability of convective activity over North Indian Ocean and Niagara in modulating onset, withdrawal, and break features of also. So this is a, is a topic basically pertaining to the ocean, how the ocean convection surrounding the Indian uh, land mass affecting the intra-seasonal and also the some part of seasonal variability of monsoon. So this is the actually, if you see the sea surface climatology for last, uh, let us say 40 years. Okay, so this is the, means always it is northwest, it's a western Pacific warm region. In addition, the Bay of Bengal and also this equatorial Indian Ocean also a warm, always it is higher than 29 degree. This is the climatology during June to September. But even when you divide these 40 years into 20, 20 years, okay, the difference, the uh, period to let recent period minus the former period. If you see here, large scale warming is there. That is, means it is there, means many studies have already indicated this warming over the North, uh, Indian Ocean and also the global. So this is a basin wide warming each prevailing during the recent period. But the, 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 there is slight difference when we critically examine the SST trend or SST. So this is a how how this North Arabian Sea, South Arabian Sea, North Bay and South Bay. The four sector, let us say, if you take the SST anomaly, a SST trend for last more than 100, around 20 years. If you see there is systematic rise in temperature, that you know now. But the Arabian Sea, the, this part, if you North Arabian Sea and South Arabian Sea, and this is North Bay South. If you look at here, the Arabian Sea warming rate is higher than the Bay of Bengal one. So this is a point that means the rate of warming over the Arabian Sea SST is relatively higher. And this is also noticed during the recent 40, 50 years uh, also in that way. But associated with this uh, warming trend, SST is also related to convection. Of course, there are some other factors also responsible. It is not so linear relation. But here, higher the SST, there is a more chance that convection will occur. So, if uh, in addition to SST trend, rise of SST, we have also examined the convection. That is the outgoing long wave radiation, how it is there. So, this is the mean outgoing long wave radiation for the 40 years period. And uh, if, if the four sectors over the North uh, Arabian Sea, North Arabian Sea, South, uh, South Arabian Sea, North Bay, and South Bay. In addition to these four sectors, 
we have also identified the works for the thing there one only the land part of india central india another is south equatorial indian ocean this is another belt and northwest pacific so this is another three convective belt these are sensitive regions so in addition to the four regions that i have shown previous in the previous slide the sst sst here this is the north arabian south arabian north bay south bay the three three uh, different region for convection also are identified central india south equatorial indian ocean north and pacific so here if you see the difference of convection convection mean olr anomaly if you see period 2 minus period 1 the large negative here olr means here more convection over recent uh, over the northwest india and uh, central india also but arabian sea everywhere it is a more convective compared to the previous 20 years so that means there is a shift in that not shift there is a increase in convective relative increase of convective activity over the arabian sea in recent time compared to the bay of bengal because other bay of bengal is more convective climatologically but here it is the difference if you see the recent and the former period more convective over the uh, and also the your pacific north west, western pacific also negative means it is more convective now then when we saw this uh, particularly the north uh, the arabian sea south arabian sea north bay and south bay the four sst sector you yes here what we are getting the arabian sea sector it significant decreasing trend in olr or increasing trend in convectivity that is very clear in north arabian sea south arabian sea whereas bay of bengal uh, it is not much miss variation there is no significant or anything so this is more that is also very prominent then there, there is a more increasing convective activity of the arabian sea particularly this. then other three convective regions how it is also behaving in other three convective region then if you look at here the central india yes the central india also we have seen in the map that is also here more it is showing more convective because decreasing olr means increasing convective activity over central india that is also many studies have indicated how this because of this one means the we have more in uh, uh, heavy rainfall event frequency are also increasing the south equatorial ocean ocean it is just the opposite I mean it is actually the opposite phase of the central india central india and south equatorial india ocean it is just the opposite phase and uh, it is one is when uh, it is uh, convective activity increasing so it is convective activity decreasing northwest pacific also just like the central india maybe is uh, increasing convective activity now coming to when we assess the increase there is also convective entry increase why in order to understand why this uh, arabian sea is slightly more convective relative to this in uh, compared to the bay of bengal or uh, even the other uh, other convective region so we did some uh, the moist static uh, analysis moist static analysis for uh, this last 40 years and if you generally the moist static profile if you see the, this is the profile this is the cpt per gz plus lq so CPT plus GZ is dry static energy that is actually increasing with height, but when LQ we added, it is decreasing up to 700 HPA in the tropics, and then again it is increasing. So this decreasing rate of decrease from 1000 HPA to 700 HPA generally it is considered as the uh, degree of moist converting instability, means 1000 minus 700. So here this is a plotted here. If you see uh, the for whole 40 years, whole 40 years here if you the how the moist static energy stability means um, um, msc 1000 minus msc 700 so this is uh, yeah so if you see here this is this is the value, um, value of, uh, more convective because tropical tropical uh, indian ocean is convectively unstable but when you see the difference be between period two and period one there is is yeah it is slightly more convective only unstable over this part particularly arabian sea that we can see in the quantitative figure here if you see the period one and period two and you just see North Arabian Sea, period one and period two. Here, yeah, the difference you can see the how the more it is more convective, particularly uh, also convective unstable actually. The degree of moist convective instability. Your North Arabian Sea, South Arabian Sea. There is difference is very visible. Means more, now it is more prominent. And Central India also similarly, it is more convective, really unstable compared to the previous twenty. And and another thing is that otherwise bay of bengal if you see not much difference bay of bengal even the northwest pacific also it is not much difference whereas this is a significant difference is noted and south equatorial indian ocean it is just the opposite means it is just just opposite in phase just like our itcj and means tropical convection zone even it is oceanic tropical convection zone is, uh, uh, active then uh, land part is, is inactive so that this is the way 
means most more convective and unstable during the recession. Then how it is related to the monsoon intra-seasonal variability? Before that, let us let me have a look on the how it is related to seasonal performance. Seasonal performance, yes, we have this uh, region. So all India rainfall also we um, calculate, and uh, then there are four convective regions: northwest homogeneous region, northwest India, central India, South Peninsula, and northeast India. And this black box is the monsoon core zone. So here, if you see how this convective and particularly related during this 40, 40 years to the different parts of the uh, region. So if you see here, the North North Arabian Sea, just see, except Northeast India, Northeast India, it is out of a means otherwise it is uh, means related. Negative correlation means actually it is a more in, in, increasing convectivity, more uh, rainfall here. So that means North Arabian Sea is very sensitive, a bit more convective here. That means rainfall is most likely on the higher side, except Northeast India. Similarly, South South Arabian Sea also similar in nature. That means Arabian Sea is more convective. But when you come to the Bay of Bengal, the upper planet two, Bay of Bengal, the North Bay is not sensitive much because it is a more convective area. But but associated with rainfall is not that much. It is very less easy. But uh, South Bay, in fact, South Bay is literally just like the Arabian Sea. That means North Arabian Sea, South Arabian Sea, and South Bay are having the similar in nature. And when it comes to the other convective region, yes, it is just the opposite. This South Equatorial Indian Ocean, it is just the opposite of this this one. And when it is more convective over the land, it is less convective over the ocean. And if there is a yeah, Pacific thing is almost no significant. It is almost uh, uh, ideal. Means not much relation. So that means uh, so, uh, the so point here is that urban sea is uh, playing a major role and are is more sensitive to the seasonal rainfall. Now the when we come to the three phases of monsoon, how it is changing in this pattern of change in convective pattern, how it is uh, changing the onset phase, uh, active back phase, and also the withdrawal phase of monsoon. So this one, this is the onset actually. Uh, yeah, if you see the the, the existing date, earlier onset lines were here. First June was onset and it was covering the entire India by 15 July. So that is 45 days it was taking to onset and progress. But when you when Dr. Pai and group uh, they calculated this uh, by taking the recent data, yeah, this is the onset line. Actually, there is not much there is not difference in the onset of over Kerala now also using the re recent data, first June. But here the coverage is, is literally early. That means it is covering when the progress is faster than and covering also by 8 July. So that, that part is there. The onset is same, but the progress is there. So when operational dates we have considered for what IMD had declared earlier from 1979. So this, this you can see very much here, how this the, the, the mean, mean date during this first half and mean date during the second half. So here, that means uh, onset, for the onset of Kerala, I have not onset over one station over Delhi. We have taken later northern India. We want to see how many days it is taking from here to here. So, in that way, if you see that means it is slightly early, onset is occurring slightly early, particularly in the over the northern India stations. Okay, so that's as per Kerala, it is same, but uh, that is slight rapid progress is occurring uh, after the onset. That's why it is taking less number of time to cover, cover the. Uh, monsoon over entire India. Then similarly the withdrawal. We, it recent, recently we have also noted the monsoon season extending even September, October 20, October 27, sometime withdrawal dates are like that. But earlier if you see here, the first September withdrawal was commencing, but now now it is 17 September withdrawal is coming based on the data, based on the recent data of rainfall that is our Pune office had calculated. So that means the monsoon season itself started. But in actual withdrawal dates, when we have declared from based on the operational IMD for uh, analysis, so yeah, this is the withdrawal date. If you see earlier, it was the day on basis when it was withdrawing, and recently always it is late. So that means this uh, withdrawal, the monsoon season is extending. Monsoon season is extending beyond September, so that is very clearly visible. And that is uh, when we did the analysis. It is delayed over the Northwest India by more than two weeks. Okay, this is two weeks. Delayed is there. Recent analysis with uh, the start of the monsoon withdrawal from Northwest India. It is found at 77. The mean com mean commencement of withdrawal date during the period, this one is about, uh, so when we calculated this one, that is also a date, uh, this will mean about uh, right. seven days, seven days late here. This this is the- I can conclude. Yeah, last time. And this shift is basically due to the 
the decreasing of uh, increasing of convection during onset and withdrawal phase. And uh, this is the also convective rainfall also. It is behaving similar way, just like OLR. This convective rainfall increasing uh, during onset and withdrawal phase, particularly break phase also not not but that. And this break break time, how it is related? For that, I have only one slide. So this is the break day or day day break day. And this is the last slide. So if you see the break day during the 940 years and how the OLR anomaly over different region. So you can see here, yeah, North Arabian Sea, if it is more convective, then break days are less. North Arabian Sea, South Arabian Sea, even Central India. Okay. Other whereas the North Bay is, is opposite. That means the Arabian Sea is playing a major role. That is the whole uh, summary of this uh, study. And uh, yeah, to summarize the, my study, uh, yes, uh, change in SST are more prominent over the Arabian Sea uh, compared to Bay of Bengal. And associated with this convective activity also increasing trend and uh, also in same time over the Arabian Sea, North Arabian, South Arabian Sea and South Bay of Bengal. So rapid progress of monsoon to the north after the onset is associated with the uh, increasing convective activity during June over the Arabian Sea. Similarly, delayed withdrawal also over Northwest India is also associated with the con increasing convectivity of mainly the Arabian Sea during the September. W with respect to the break conditions, yes, even the more convection over the North or South Arabian Sea or South Bay is likely to have the less number of break. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, partner. Very interesting talk. Uh, actually, it's very interesting talk and there should be a lot of questions, but uh, time is already running late. In spite of that, I will ask you one single question. Yes, sir. Is Indian Ocean warming has anything to do with this uh, observation? Indi uh, Indian Ocean uh, warming, uh, warming is there because uh, Indian Ocean, that we have shown, Arabian Sea is warming more, higher rate, and also the convection. Okay. Increasing at higher rate over the Arabian Sea. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we'll uh, move to the next speaker. That is John P. George. He is from NCMRWF. And recently they have been developing a lot of Reynolds products. And he'll be talking about that. John, please share your screen. Yeah, screen is seen, but PPT. PPT is visible? Yes. Make it full screen and uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah, please. Okay. okay, thank you. So, here I will be presenting uh, an overview of the NCMRWF reanalysis uh, and the how the some of the monsoon features are represented in the this reanalysis, especially in the high resolution reanalysis. I will be focusing on that one. So, see, I will start with what is reanalysis. So, we know that the, uh, it is a ret retrospective analysis performed uh, using a state-of-the-art NWP model and the data simulation system and the, all the observations available uh, to the available. So, but the operational simulation system, we know that the, the limitation is that the, the data simulation will be that whatever that period and the, it will be updating every maybe a couple of years and the observations within the uh, in the cutoff time only will be used. So all these limitations will be there in the the normal operation NWP analysis. Whereas in a reanalysis, so you will be having more data and whatever the latest uh, data simulation system and the model will be used. So that way it will be a more representative of the what you can say the better state of the atmosphere. We can get it in a atmospheric reanalysis. So, so in that way, we can use it, uh, uh, use it for the, uh, for the uh, weather and past weather and climate studies. So, NCMRWF uh, in recent time produced two reanalysis. One is a global reanalysis. It's a NGFS uh, high resolution. Uh, it's a global reanalysis of 25 kilometer resolution, and it is uh, for the 20 years, uh, 20 years from the. Uh, uh, 1999 to uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2018 and the another is the regional reanalysis which is IMDA uh, uh, which is of 12 kilometer resolution and resolution and it is uh, 
uh, what it is for the 42 years from 79, 79 to 2020. So there is a 42 years reanalysis. So when you're coming to the NGFS in a, uh, what are the salient features? See NGFS is a global reanalysis and um, the data simulation is used, 3D war is used, GSI, basically the GSI and the atmospheric model is GFS and uh, roughly it is a horizontal resolution is 25 kilometer and is, uh, there are uh, vertic 64 vertical level going up to 55 kilometer. So it's a, uh, what you can say, it's a very high, the comparatively high resolution global reanalysis uh is uh is a in uh ngfs system so it's a that reanalysis product is available for the 20 years and in the, when you're coming to the uh, imda reanalysis the domain is given here and it is uh, the uh, the data simulations method is the 4d war and uh, is a 12 kilometer resolution and uh, uh, we use the data sets from the ecnwf ncmrwf uk met office and imd in this reanalysis. So there are a lot of additional data which is from the IMD is gone into this uh, reanalysis system, especially the surface and the sounding. So these are the different, uh, I will be mainly focusing on the IMDA and the most of the data sets are similar in nature. So you can see that the in the last uh, 40, 40, this is about 40 years, 42 years, uh, uh, so you can see that the, the what are the different type of data set is used in this reanalysis. So in the later period in the, both the reanalysis, Sapphire data is also used. And these are the different, uh, what you can say, the satellite, what are the satellite used in that period? Satellite uh, radiances are used in that period. So when you coming to the, uh, this is IMDA that uh, the exclusive observations, which is available with IMD, so in the surface observations, for example, this is a particular month of 2014. You can you can see that in that month, around 244 uh, extra SINOP observations are available, which is not there in the ECNWF uh, data set. So that we added to the ECNWF data set and used in the IMDA reanalysis. So like that, whatever the additional observations we could gather it or went into this uh, reanalysis. So, the, the any reanalysis we have to see that uh, how the O minus A and O minus B is behaving and we can see that O minus A should be smaller. So we can see that here I am left side it is a surface observations and you can see that the uh, for the entire period uh, y x axis is the entire the period is given and the, and the uh, so you can see that the RMC is given in the uh, y axis you can see that the RMCs are reduced in the O minus A. So that is expected from any good reanalysis. And you can see in the lower, the lowest panel, you can say, see that the, uh, the observations are increased after 2000. Roughly after 2000, there's a good increase of the observation. This is for pressure is green and temperature is, uh, uh, observations are in a given purple color. You can see that in both, there is a good increase of the data. Uh, number of observations are simulated and the uh, in the upper panel is the the pressure and the lower middle panel is the temperature armacies you can see then both it is uh, uh, with the an analysis without with the analysis is improving the armacy armas with the observations so in the right side it is uh, about the radius on day against the radius on day here also we can see that the that uh, armas are uh, much uh, what you can say uh, improvement is seen uh, compared to the uh, surface, uh, which is also which is uh, expected in a good reanalysis. Then the uh, in the uh, in, after uh, of course in the uh, uh, there are some periods their uh, number of observations are less. This is lower panel. So, but uh, after that in the recent time it is increasing. Uh, India, when you are coming to the accumulated rainfall during the monsoon period. So we can see that the it is uh, comparing. This is only over the uh, Indian land region. Uh, so you can see that the uh, we can see that the there is a, a good comparison between the uh, the the IMD observations and the greater observations and the IMDA reanalysis. Uh, you can if you can go to the how the monsoon onset and withdraw 
well are represented in this reanalysis in the imda reanalysis you can see that the, this is a comparison of imda era 5 and the imd uh, with the imd observations imd what are the actual date of uh, uh, onset and withdrawal so you can see that the uh, with the, uh, the compared to the era 5 uh, imda is slightly better so you can see that the withdrawal day, uh, the both the uh, uh, both the the onset and the withdrawal dates are slightly better, but more or less uh, IRA and the IMDA are similar in nature. Uh, if you go to the monsoon low level jet, how it is represented in the IMDA reanalysis and when it compared to IRA 5, you can see that the uh, the correlation between both are, uh, it is in the, um, um, in the four months are given, June, July, August and September. The, uh, the right side you can see the upper panel is June and the lower panel is September. You can see that the in the June there is a very good correlation, but uh, in July and August is re slightly reduced with the era 5, but in September again very good correlation you can see that. But one thing is what we noticed is that there is a decreasing trend in the low level, low level jet in the IMDA, uh, which is uh, some of the purpose are also indicating uh, that type of, which is not seen in the era 5 that much is not uh, visible so when you are coming to the monsoon convection also you can see the comparison of the kalpana oilar with the this is a mean feature uh, with the imda for the 2004 2017 period you can see that the is a it is comparing well so this is about the net surface radiation. This is against the income bus observations. Upper panel is from 2015 to 2018 January, 2015 August to 18 January period. So you can see that the uh, this is a, here we have the IMDA is there, the ERA is there, uh, then the NCM analysis and forecasts are there. So you can see that the the uh, income bus is the red color. So, and the IMDA is the blue color. You can see that the blue is uh, close in, uh, especially in the peak values, when the, uh, the IMDA is, uh, uh, is close to the observations. Uh, so, up, lower panel is, uh, is another station, upper is the Kanpur and the lower is the J. Silmer. So, this is um, uh, different uh, seasons, how the uh, the what you can say the extremes are represented in the uh, in this uh, IMDA analysis. So this is a comparison of the IMD observations against the uh, with the IMDA and the NGFS reanalysis. So this is a probability distribution of rainfall intensity uh, from IMD, IMDA, and NGFS and the RAF5. We can see that the both the NCM um, the Indian reanalysis that the IMDA and the NGFS is uh, in the especially in the higher rainfall uh, intensity domain region uh, higher intensities so it is uh, comparing well with the observation when you come compared to the era 5 so the red color is the era 5 and uh, these uh, data sets are available in the ncmrwf uh, web portal so you can access this data from the NCMRWF web portal. Uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, in, uh, very recently, we are added to the, some of the sub vertical velocity was not there in the IMDA that we are added. So, uh, which we are adding actually within uh, one or two days, it will be available. And uh, these are the uh, different data sets are available. And IMDA, one thing is that the hourly data sets are available from IMDA. Most of the single level data sets in the hourly frequency it is available and the other uh, pressure level data is available in the three hourly data three hourly period and the and the global reanalysis ngf or six hourly data sets is data set is available and the monthly fields are also available from our web portal uh, freely so these are the different fields uh, different uh, variables we can access so I am not going into the details. So these are the different publications. Also, these are all, this information is also available in the uh, in the uh, reanalysis portal. Uh, you can see it. You can refer it. So what I want to say is that 
our studies are indicating that this reanalysis these reanalysis can be used for monsoon studies and uh, and it is well uh, um, means in in so many monsoon features it is uh, represented better compared to other reanalysis so other best reanalysis in the world so this can be used for uh, studying the monsoon uh, different uh, monsoon characteristics so with that i'll uh, stop my presentation thank you thank you john it's very nice presentation and it's very useful product that has been developed by ncmrwf so there is one question from madhu is uh, why there is a problem with uh, imda humidity profiles above 13 km altitude above 13 km yeah so actually above 13 km humidity will be very very small yeah that's true the so but i don't know it will be very 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 small so there is no not much meaning in uh, going to the analysis about that and there is no observation about 13 kilometer we are assimilated so whatever is coming from the model background it will be used so so we have to take into account all these things when, uh, when we are using the reanalysis data set not only in our ngfs any reanalysis data set okay thank you john okay thank you i start yeah so our next speaker will be yogesh tiwari he will be talking about interplay between greenhouse gases and indian summer monsoon rainfall yogesh please share your screen yeah thank you sir now hope you can see my screen yes it is visible make it full screen yes okay so good morning chair and good morning to all of you i'm yogesh from IITM Pune. So the topic which I would like to talk is the interplay between monsoon and greenhouse gases variability in India. So in the first slide, you can see the background is basically our observational site, which is almost uh, 50 to 60 kilometers from here. It's a Sinegar mountain. You can see on the top, there is one tower over there. So this is our one of observation site uh, uh, since 2009. So uh, as a background, so what is the basically contemporary global carbon budget during 2010 to 19? Then I will come how, uh, what are the monsoonal effect on greenhouse gases and then how they affect each other. So you can see that uh, there are two things for uh, basically in uh, carbon budget source and sink. So from the source side, so basically the fossil fuel are responsible for 86% of the emissions and land use change for the 14%. And when it's, uh, it is emitted, then it goes, and then there are three pools which really stores this carbon. One is basically the land biosphere, which really stores 31%. Second is ocean, 23%, but it is very slow process. And then the remaining goes 46% in the atmosphere. So this 46% basically works as a, uh, uh, as a changing of uh, relative forcing and various other uh, climate change issues, this greenhouse gases work. So basically there is a budget imbalance of uh, 0.2 gigaton carbon per year, uh, almost 0.4%. So what is CO2 emission from India? So you can see from the left side, there is a time series of CO2 emission over South Asia during 1990, 2000, 2009. This is actually published uh, picture uh, from Patra et al. 2013, you can see that uh, the total fossil fuel CO2 emissions, as well as the difference, uh, as well as CO, uh, fossil fuel from different countries in the South Asia, from Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan. And the right side is the region, basically the landmass selected for, uh, this is from the recap uh, data uh, over the South Asian region. So over this region, you can see that uh, the total fossil fuel is a black line and then Indian is a, is a blue line and all other countries are different colors. So basically, uh, and then there is a large uncertainty also uh, in this. We cannot say that these are the numbers which really uh, give a, a very high uncertainty. So there is a high uncertainty in this. Uncertainty of estimated emission of CO2 over above the region are larger due to lack of sufficient CO2 monitoring. So. 
now uh, gg concentration observations what iatm has uh, taken over in the past um, decade uh, more than a decade uh, at the surface sites and uh, uh, using the cruise in bia bengal and then using the aircraft so and also iatm has a gg flux monitoring towers it's called a metflux project at different locations over india so currently our uh, site at kajiranga national park it is uh, in operational and uh, now i wanted to show you some of the slides uh, which really related to the topic influence of monsoon and atmospheric co2 variability from surface to upper atmosphere so at the surface if you see basically this is a co2 concentration variability as surface monitoring site this is at the two site uh cri is basically k prama in goa and then sng is with uh, siagar uh, which you have seen the picture so if you see so there is a C, uh, smaller co2 variability almost uh, uh, 8 to 10 ppm during the monsoon month so this one during this time and uh, if you see uh, during the non monsoon months for example during the winter time this variability is basically almost 15 ppm so this is in uh, part due to higher vegetation cover in these months due to the intermittent precip uh, precipitation spell. So the observational record also indicated large variance seen at uh, Sinagar during post monsoon months that uh, then seen at K Prama. So and uh, if we see uh, the CO2 sources, uh, the variability uh, using the Lagrangian modeling at uh, Sinagar site. So during winter time and during the monsoon time. So winter time, basically the um, uh, the air mass transport is from the continental part. So it means it covers during winter time almost and uh, half of India. And uh, if we see the surface sensitivity, how sensitive this site, basically this is uh, ppm uh, per micromole per meter square per second. So you can see uh, the sensitivity is almost over the continental part. However. Uh, during the monsoon time, basically the winds are from the Arabian Sea and then the sensitivity also over the water. It means if the winds are air masses coming from the continental part, they are more like variable. Uh, the sources are, uh, are very variable. And however, if we, uh, air masses from the Arabian Sea, sources are almost constant. So that's why the variability between these two in uh, if we convert in greenhouse gases, then almost a half. Next, we have done some uh, aircraft observations during Kaipex airplane campaign. These are the some photographs uh, we have done uh, during different years. And uh, if we see some of uh, the preliminary result. So uh, on the top left, if you see, this is the uh, atmospheric methane. So methane is very important greenhouse gas after uh, the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide, and it has a it's uh, uh, basically global warming potential is almost 80 times than carbon dioxide and it's a uh, uh, sink. I mean, it's, it's a lifetime is almost 10 to 12 years. So this is this becomes a very important. Now it got uh, attention from uh, from IPCC and UNCCC and also from various countries. So you can see at the surface during uh, July 2015 at Kolapur, we have taken this observation. So gray one is a different profiles of atmospheric methane and then black is the mean of those profiles. So during monsoon time, you can see uh, the methane at the surface is lower. And as soon as we go up, so almost it peaks around four to five uh, kilometers. So almost there is 40 to 50 ppb difference and then it becomes uh, again uh, comes on the normal if we see a carbon monoxide this is basically combustion comes from the combustion it's almost similar kind of structure we see so it means during the monsoon time over this area there is some large scale air mass transport which brings the pollution over this area uh, this is basically uh, uh, with a different height this is uh, uh, using the slope how uh, uh, um, i will not go in detail much detail uh, so if you see uh, the picture over uh, Varanasi in the September 2014, uh, so almost it was the end of monsoon, but you can see it's almost opposite picture. So at the surface, atmospheric methane is high, and as soon as we go up, it becomes uh, uh, lower, and then it becomes like a background value. So we have many profiles over here, and then similarly, the carbon monoxide also so now if we see this only observations and then if we don't see the model simulation or we see only model simulation 
and this kind of structure is seen in the model. So we will suspect that why model is showing higher at the middle troposphere, uh, almost four to five kilometers. But uh, we have taken two models. One is LMDZ and one is ACTM. So this LMDZ is uh, 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer and LMDZ ACTM is uh, 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer. So you can see the overall pattern at these two models are there following for the atmospheric methane almost uh, almost same over uh, Kolapur area. And also over the Ganga Basin uh, in 2014 September, uh, the models are following. It means there is a, some large scale uh, uh, phenomena which is basically a meteorology and then captured by the models also. So if you don't have observations, these models are basically uh, we we cannot understand this such kind of structures in the model. So such observations will go in the model for the uh, CO2 uh, uh, methane sources and sink estimations. So basically, uh, what uh, um, uh, the, uh, the basic thing what uh, what is behind this? Why we are getting high uh, methane at five kilometers? So basically, we uh, we thought this just to show you some assumption. So during the monsoon time, due to convection. If air mass, uh, when air mass goes up and then in the easterly flow, basically it comes and it starts moving over over this area. So at southwesterly monsoon flow convection and then it start moving. So we are getting high over this area. So probably the surface emission goes up and then we are getting high over this area. So once it is up and then uh, the high uh, seems here. This is very interesting picture. Uh, we have tried to see the polluted clouds using the carbon monoxide data. So uh, the first uh, uh, three plots from the left uh, here, uh, this is basically, this shows the cloud droplet number concentration uh, me uh, measures how many, basically uh, cloud droplet number concentration uh, says that how many droplets uh, are there uh, at the base of a cloud per unit volume. And uh, uh, the previous studies, uh, the scientists have used this uh, quantity as a proxy of to cloud condensation nuclei. So in this figure, this is y-axis is carbon monoxide and x-axis we have relative humidity, water vapor and cloud droplet concentration three. So shows that cloud droplet concentration variation with the altitude during uh, the skypec observation. So July 2015 it is. So polluted clouds are in the altitude range of three to four kilometers here. And uh, the uh, where CO2 concentration are more than 100 ppb, and then non polluted clouds are at the higher altitude. So, over like 100 ppb, so we have a three to four kilometers, we have a polluted cloud. This is another interesting picture over the Ganga basin September 2015, but you can see the carbon monoxide values almost doubled over this area. So, this shows that um, carbon monoxide versus relative humidity and then water vapor. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, water vapor S2 variations with the altitude over Ganga Basin. If we are to form a cloud, humidification may eventually bring the air within the parcel to saturation. So at saturation, the relative humidity is 100%. So usually a little more humidification is required, which brings the relative humidity to over 100%. So a state known as super saturation. So before a cloud will form, so relative humidity is close to 100% uh, below 3.5 kilometers. Uh, and uh, carbon monoxide value at this altitude are in the polluted range, means almost 200 to 200 ppb, uh, uh, 200 to 250 ppb uh, range. So which indicates that the cloud formation at this level will be in the polluted atmosphere. Uh, clouds are created when water vapor uh, and is invisible gas turns into the liquid water droplets. So the water vapor content of the atmosphere uh, varies from near zero to about four uh, percent uh, here, uh, zero to four percent. So depending on the moisture on the surface beneath the air of the temperature. So basically, uh, the first time we have tried uh, this using carbon monoxide and then try to see the polluted, uh, the reason where a cloud will form in the polluted clouds. Uh, this one is uh, yes you yes 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 I will show you just just one one or two slides so okay, then this is the aircraft observations uh, from Frankfurt to Chennai uh, in the middle troposphere you can see during monsoon time we see a high atmospheric methane and then SF6 and then N2O and uh, I will skip this and then this is my conclusion I will not read it yeah thank you very much thank you Agesh for a very interesting study. And uh, it is one of the interesting uh, aspect how greenhouse gases and ISM are related. So, any questions from audience? Uh, 
a quick question. No questions. Okay, thank you, Yogesh. Thank you, thank you, sir. So, last speaker of this uh, session will be Professor Sachinarayana from uh, KLM University, and his talk is on identification of temperature and heat wave zones over India. Sachinarayana, please yes, sir, sir, share sir. your screen. Sir, I guess, sir. No, okay, sir. I will share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just hold on. Yeah, I will just take out. Sir, is uh, it visible my screen, sir? Yeah, screen is visible. Make it full screen now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm saying it, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, happy WM day. This is the first time I am. Uh, sir, uh, my voice is audible. Yes, sir. It is yes, clear, sir. Word. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is, I would like to discuss. That is, um, yeah, identification of temperatures, some heat waves. Uh, our uh, uh, yeah, Indian regions. That is, this is uh, work, research work uh, carried out and supported by the Central Government of India under the ECR stream. But uh, my co authors, D.V. Baskar Rao and Navena, in the screen was. Uh, this is, uh, I'm using in this identification of uh, heat waves and thunder, uh, that is, the temperature zones. For these, these are the materials I'm using. And these are the data sets I have to follow to for the identification of these uh, heat waves and uh, temperature zones. Uh, please observe what happened uh, in this uh, pictures. That is uh, April to May. That is a temperature how varying day to day. Uh, please looking this one. There is no temperature above 40 degrees centigrade before 26. After 30 at first May, the temperature slowly rising. That is a one spell. This is the going of a cup swap. Again, uh, 16th May, the temperatures above 45 degrees centigrade is reaching. That is also traveling every year. This is following this one. This is looking this one that is a looking a one type of heat river that is a heat river coming from this west rajasthan to south uh, east indian region that is also i'm looking in the identify the three temperatures why this is the reasons why number of persons are died under this region uh, due to the heat waves time during summer time 2015 number of persons 2500 members died under this region only 2003 members in under this and 2013 severe heat wave, 1400 members died all over India. That is 1393 heat waves. Every year, this is the following. That is why uh, the heat wave deaths are more in this uh, under this reason due to this one. This is the analysis of wind flow over the uh, larger South Asian domain. So this is the westerly or southwesterly wind flow from the Middle East bringing the hot air into the Indian subcontinent through the northwest parts. The desert regions of Northwest India thus recorded highest temperatures. However, Northwest India advocated heat from this Northwest uh, to the central parts of India. That is a daytime. That is a land and sea breeze affected as so more influences here. This is a discomfort index is more. Coming to this one, this is the computed using in the IMD meteorological uh, department follow the temperatures uh, uh, heat waves can area. That is a uh, computed every year 2015. 1951 to 2015 but before it is in this figure um identified this before 70 no heat waves were caused of southeast indian regions or telangana and uh Andhra Pradesh region there is this implanting nominations 1970s maybe due to the global warming trends these results are with ross et al 2018 so reported after the heat waves since 1970 were observed uh, in india during the same uh, current global warming is yes, looking this is special distribution of national temperatures for our Indian subcontinent were analyzed using the IMD graded temperatures data from the period 1951 to 2020 zones of hottest regions with the highest temperatures uh, were identified the frequencies of number of days with the temperatures exceeding 40 degrees centigrade has been computed these highest temperatures and frequencies of hot days were found to be the uh, over the south central parts of India, that is our weather part, Telangana uh, region. This is the constructing, this is generally anticipated high temperatures of Rajasthan due to the higher uh, latitude and the desert, uh, desert surfaces. This is coming to this temperature, there is also more number of days or weather part regions, more warm, but compared to the northwestern uh, region like Rajasthan areas. By coming to this is the uh, mean horizontal temperature divergence. There is uh, uh, lower levels of showing the district convergent zones that is the causes accumulated of uh, heat 
supported by the local surface heating of black soil, um, giving rise is the hot blood boil that The atmospheric flow pattern, uh, that is March and April, uh, with the uh, two high pressure zones over the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal region, forming the east west ridge over the Tropic of Kansas with a low. Uh, this is a call region, we call call region, uh, was noted to be these reasons. For the accumulation of heat over weather for Telangana. This is a synoptic reasons confirmed the earlier studies, uh, Supram et al. 1988 is set up. The vertical, this is the uh, earlier study. So, in this is the vertical uh, variation of the um, vertical velocity. So, the dystopic variation is near the surface below one kilometer. The rises in motions are weather for uh, subsidence. Uh, Rajasthan confirmed the uh, that horizontal advections so local heating is responsible to the upset of the highest temperatures and maximum hard days for weather by region. That is also mean and standard deviation coefficient of variation is also more in this weather per region is showing. That is above outcomes of conclusion. This is the uh, results, uh, the hottest regions of Indian subcontinent or weather per situated in the south central parts, although these several studies, and that is a past studies, several studies are identified this, uh, that is a uh, weather per regions more warmer uh, like so Brahmi at 2018. Uh, this is the interesting. This is a during May month. What's the maximum temperatures? Uh, uh, is follow the surface maximum temperatures. Really, the three regions. Series one is the West Rajasthan, North Madhya Pradesh, and South West Uttar Pradesh and East Maharashtra. This is the weather for region. Uh, the number of uh, with the temperatures higher than the 42 degrees centigrade days. That's depicted identified the three zones. One is a T1, West Rajasthan, and T2, North Madhya Pradesh, and South UP, and T3, that is uh, weather per regions, a maximum number of uh, days is occurred during the uh, May month, uh, about 10 days. That is in this picture, that is also between the analysis of heat waves period considering the IMD criteria for the occurrence of heat wave conditions. Uh, three district regions, that is HW1, HW2, HW3, I mean HW1 North and HW2 Northeast and Southeast parts of India, uh, these all are the three important regions are uh, different from the these uh, temperatures zones. This is the uh, regions maximum temperatures are not have heat waves locations, but they induce the heat waves through the downwind attractions under the power of atmospheric conditions. Looking this one, this is anomalies of this uh, wind anomalies. Uh, the heat wave periods for the three vulnerable regions, uh, HW1, HW2, HW3, uh, reveal that the anomalies southwesterly and westerly and northwesterly and wind, uh, not that northwesterly winds here, this is T3. Uh, so from these uh, regions, West Rajasthan, T1, North Madhya Pradesh, and T2, and East Maharashtra, T3, is contributed to the onset of heat waves over the North HW1, HW2, and South East HW3 parts of India is also um, uh, 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 influences this onset of heat waves. This is another important, that is the temperatures uh, zones, uh, heat wave zones are identified for first time applying this UAF analysis, empirical orthogonal functions are like a principal component analysis had been used to identify the heat wave zones. The specifics clearly uh, distinguish with the existing three heat wave regions, which is a confirm the results from the temperatures analysis. Is it is informed that the HW1 had been highest variance follow the HW2 and HW3 is denoted the respective. This is a, another important, but this is looking this one, uh, this table, that is a HW1, North India, Northeast India, Southeast India. Mm. Northeast India, that is North India, that is uh, uh, heat waves, 34 heat waves after 1951 to 2015. Uh, that is uh, out of the contributed the 82 days. Northeast India, 31, uh, uh, heat waves is contributed to 165 days. That Southeast India, that is uh, uh, 21 heat waves is identified, is, uh, that is uh, contributed to 111 days. There is a more uh, intensity of heat waves are increasing after 70s. Before 70s, no heat waves seen here, Southeast Indian region. After 70, heat waves is occurred. 
that's why that is here. Uh, costal landra regions, ETS is more or vulnerability regions are identified. These are another examples. Uh, the CMIFI models are also uh, confirm the temperature zones T1, T2, T3 is also easily depicted. Uh, that is another more important soil temperatures. Uh, Expert similar characteristics of temperatures with the uh, highest values are considered with the, those temperatures, say temperatures, anomalous regions coincide with the heat waves. This is observations uh, uh, um, identify these heat waves uh, zones is clearly depicted. That is another one is so why this is a number of uh, uh, household capacity I've taken from this uh, census 2011. Uh, data that is uh, I identified the vulnerability of these workers and populations uh, as the resource works. And that's why India under those reasons more vulnerability reasons we identified. Why these uh, three temperatures and T2 zones are uh, what are the tendencies as of all over the 1951 to 2015? This is observed that that is a heat wave zone two, that is a heat northeast Indian uh, uh, temperatures are negative tendencies. Remaining to HW1, HW2, T1, T2 is showing positive trend or increasing tendency in this way. heat wave days also increasing in Northwest India and Southeast Indian regions, except that is also decreasing trends in Northeast Indian region. Uh, this is the computed in heat wave uh, days, you know, 40 degrees centigrade hours per day. That is in this purpose, I'm utilizing 40 years hourly data. I'm using this one March, April, and May and June. Uh, here uh, clearly seen that is the uh, March month we cannot see in the above 40 degree centigrade or coastal regions. Okay. Yes, sir, yes, sir. These are the days is also per day, uh, four to six days hours uh, occurring. That is uh, never the discomfort. Why is this number of heat waves, uh, heat wave deaths are more in this coastal region? Discomfort index is more. Uh, this is the another example. Why there is Illinois Lano ES as influences number of Illinois plus exceeding Illinois yes, decay Illinois yes, the heat waves are increasing. This positive tendency is also showing that is uh, uh, is magma temperature in southeastern regions. That is same also follow this uh, temperatures, but because of this uh, Illinois exceeding Illinois yes, more number of years and that temperature is increasing in the R21 model showing future 2100 temperature trends are rising. Uh, this is the my work, thank you very much, sir, giving this opportunity. Sir. Thank you, Sachinanda. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, I think we have concluded this session with uh, your talk. Yes, sir. There is one question from Madhu. Madhu, you want to go ahead? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. I can ask, sir. So, the question yes, is, sir. Uh, uh, sir. You mentioned over the weather behind others. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. I just want to know. Per second is per second how much? Sir, sir, I am not clear your voice. Sir. Could you please? Madhu, what you do is, uh, you can, uh, Madhu, you can send your uh, question to him. You can answer through email. Okay. Yes, sir, session yes, time yes, is over. Yes, and actually, I want to thank each and every speaker. There's very interesting results you have shown and very uh, thought provoking talks. Unfortunately, not much time is there to Engaging yes, discussions, so I'm really sorry for that. And but Mike, yes, sir. Is yours. yeah, yeah. So, first of all, sir, I should thank you for nicely chairing this session. For very interesting talks were there, and also the time time factor is also yes, perfectly all right. Actually, we are closing at, at right time, that means there is no deviation. So, the uh, the second day, the invited session, and the first. Uh, this oral session, parallel oral session that have completed now. I think the hall B also is going on. I think that will be soon completed. So after that, again, uh, we will have our uh, evening session, local evening session, where our formal inauguration will be there. First, uh, that is uh, 1800 IST, uh, that is 1230 UTC. So for formal inauguration will be followed by the invited talk. So I also would like to make some announcement about the e-posters. Those who have already submitted their e-posters, PPT, uh, PDF and video, we have uploaded that thing. And uh, since the poster session, uh, sort of short oral session will be commencing from tomorrow. So we'll request those who have not submitted, please submit positively by today so that everything will be available on you know, our website. Thank you again. So see you all again uh, in the afternoon evening session. 
at uh, 12:30 utc and our uh, local time is 6 o'clock 6 pm thank you very much thank you very much sir patnaik sir very much sir patnaik thank you all thank you sir thank you patnaik sir thank you thank you sir iw aslan and surya sir thank you very much thank you sir surya sir thank you sir